What is up everyone? We are going to be doing another Total Conflict Resistance tutorial. I do have one up on the channel already that's a few months old and I figured I would put a 2.0 version up because the game has been updated and there's some changes and I didn't go over a lot of the things that I probably should have went over. So I wanted to redo a tutorial because as it stands now, it seems like the community is still having a bit of an issue trying to understand what's going on, why we're doing things and how we're doing things. And that is totally understandable considering this game has no tutorial to speak of. The only tutorial it really has is if you come down here to the right bottom right corner, you can click on that help button and it'll just take you to a Steam page where it goes over some stuff. I mean, you could get some useful information out of here, but some of this stuff is so old. Like this UI, this UI hasn't been used since I started playing and that's been you know, a while ago. So you can come here for help, but I figured I would put another tutorial up because I'm still getting questions on um, my videos on how and why I'm doing things and maybe kind of the, the thought process on why I'm doing things. So we're going to get into here. I'm also going to put in timestamps and I'm going to try and um, categorize information. The only thing is that this game is Every mechanic is kind of bound together with each other that it's hard to focus on one part of the game without going into a whole other rant on how that works with some other mechanic that works with it. It's all tied into each other. So I'm going to try and stay focused and we're going to try and stay on track with each individual thing that we're talking about. So hopefully that will work out. And I don't know how long this video is going to be. It's going to be as long as it's going to be. Um, I, yeah, there, there, we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> Let's say that I'm going to leave the camera on now. I think I need to move it later, but all right. So the first thing I want to talk about is that this is a campaign that is, it's an early save of a campaign that I have up on the channel right now. This is our total war campaign. As you can see, we're at war with all the factions. Um, we'll talk about diplomacy later. But uh, if you guys want to check out this series, it's up on the channel now. And if you want to check out any other total war, total conflict resistance um, footage or series, there's plenty of those up on the channel, as well as other games and other series. It's not just a total conflict resistance channel. So if you guys like this content and you want to check out some other stuff, there's plenty of videos on the channel for you to check out. So we're going to start off here. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the menu or the, your option settings, because there are some settings in here that can greatly change the way that you play the game. So we're going to go into options. We're going to go into gameplay. So first thing we have here is difficulty. I play on realistic. I don't know if that's the hardest difficulty for me as a gamer. Realistic has always been the most difficult setting you can put it on, but we do have expert. I don't know if these are bugged out or if it's a typo or what's going on. I just play on realistic. That's just what I play on. One thing to note is that difficulty does not affect AI behavior on the battlefield. It only affects the the buffs and the deep the buffs that the AI get on the campaign map and the debuffs you get on the campaign map. And there might be debuffs or on the battle um on the battle map as well. Maybe the enemy gets 120 health instead of hundred. I don't know what the numbers are. I just know it doesn't affect AI behavior on the battlefield at all. It has all to do with the campaign map and what bonuses the AI gets on the campaign map with resource management and production. Uh, we have, speaking of resource management, we have resource management tab. So I play on easy. And the reason I play on easy is because I find the micromanagement of resource management uh, very tedious and I find it slows down the game and it doesn't really need to happen because you have the resources. I could see it maybe in the early game, but even then it's kind of unnecessary and I'll try to explain why I'll try and explain my philosophy as we go along. So as you can see, if we play on easy consuming food from a shared pool, so what that should actually say is food, ammunition, and fuel. It sh those three resources are going to be shared within your empire for your population and your uh, battalions, your armies. Um, everything else, 
I guess it would say everything is in a shared pool. Well, not everything. So I'm going off course here. So let's let's go back into the campaign map. So the only so right now I have Verma. Verma has all my food. What I've turned Verma into is my it has all of our well it has 94 we have st staggered resources and all these uh different cities that's just because it hasn't moved over but whenever i conquer a city i move all the resources from that city to verma so this is everything this is about 95 percent of what is in our empire's inventory so we have our food here we have our bread our wheat our meat and we do have canned goods i don't know where that's coming from i don't know where they are they're not in our inventory right now no so we have canned goods somewhere i don't know where they are so that means an easy resource management that it's being spread within my entire empire automatically. It's pulling from Verma and taking it autom automatically to all of our cities in our empire. If you go to, and that goes with ammunition. So I have, I have a battalion down here in Compelios. We do have supplies in Compelios because I just captured this city. This is the capital of this faction. So there is... Um, there is resources here that I'm going to move to Verma, all of it. So if let's say this army was in Rasfet up here. So this town, this city is ours. It has nothing in it. There's no, there's absolutely nothing, no resources in this city. I could still move our army here and replenish its ammunition. So I could come over. This army is fully equipped. It has hundred percent ammunition. We'll go through that later. But I could still go to Rasvet. Let's say we just had a battle and we were depleted a little bit with ammunition. I could go over to Rasvet, hit the rearmament of the battalion, and it would refill the ammunition even though there's nothing here. It would be the same as the food. It would pull ammunition from wherever, probably from Verma or depending on what it was, because we do have ammunition being built in Sonder, so it could pull from here as well. Looks like we have already because usually you make a thousand rounds. Pretty sure... Every round is a thousand, but we're getting off track. Either way, ammunition can be replenished at any city, whether it has it there or not. And same with fuel. So we need fuel for our mechanized units. We can we can go to Razvet. There's nothing here. Even if we had our battalion there, we were low on fuel. We can go there and replenish the fuel as well. Other things that are shared within our empire. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's is all of our building resources. So we can go to our construction queue. We're building, let's cancel this. Uh, we can go to Luango and build anything we want. And we don't need to have the resources. Where is Luango? Up here. So Luango, the city here that we just checked out on our construction screen. If we wanted to build, Let's say we wanted to build a sawmill. It's going to take 45 wood. Four, it's going to take $4,000, 45 wood, and 25 stone. So I would click on that. It's going to build it. I don't need the resources in Luongo. I don't need the $4,000, the 25 wood, and the whatever it was. I can't remember. So I don't need the... I don't need to have $4,000, 45 wood, and 25 stone in the city to build the sawmill. And also goes along with our production. So in Luongo, are we building anything there? No. So let's say we're in Allendorf. So we'll go to Allendorf. Right now, as you can see on the right-hand side, Allendorf is making copper ore, and it's also producing five, five, six rounds. So if you go into your production tab, we can find Allendorf here on the right side. So Allendorf, these two production cues, we're making copper ore and a 762 rounds. And as you can see, it says it takes two iron to make one round of 762 rounds. So that means I would need two iron every time it made a thousand right here, 762 rounds. I don't know. Well, it, I can tell you how long it's going to take. So it's going to take 24 hours to make a thousand rounds at a hundred percent efficiency. We'll get into this later, but I'm just showing you briefly here. So every 24 hours at a hundred percent efficiency in Allendorf for two iron, we're making a thousand rounds. So you would have to make sure that you had 
enough. You'd have to make sure you had iron ingots there to keep making those rounds. But for me, I don't need to because it's on easy resource management. It's just pulling it from wherever it's pulling it from our global pool, uh, wherever it is. I might have, I, I think all of our irons in Verma, but if I had it in Fiskadel and Verma, it would just pull it. I don't know if it pulls it from the closest one, <coughs> excuse me, or if it just picks a random city, but it'll just pull any, I don't, the point is I don't need to have the resources in the city for it to be built. So we're going to go back into our options. So I play on easy because I find it less tedious because I have the resources. It's not like I need to, I don't really care about sending the resources out because I have them anyways, just let the cities have them. Otherwise all it, all that, all the real. So if you, let's go over this medium food consumption in each city, that means for, for food, you would have to make sure we'll hover over Allendorf again. Let's choose the city because we're, we're kind of picking on it. So as you, excuse me, I'm trying to, I'm getting over a cold. So the population of Allen Allendorf is 388. It's daily food intake is three weekly food intake of 21 and 90 or monthly food intake of 90. So that means considering you can only send stuff weekly, as you can see, repeat weekly, you can do here, you would have to pick a food city and send a column. You would have to send at least 21. You probably want to go a bit over maybe 22, but you, so I would come to here or wherever Verma's got Verma's not a food produce, producing city, but it has our food in here because we play on meat on easy. Um, but let's say Valens shanty valor shanty was our food city and we had a bakery here and it was producing food we would come here let's just say this wheat is our bread um you would go so they're consuming 21 weekly you would want to go to 21 i can't type this in you have to you have to use a slider so you kind of have to make it as close as possible i don't know if you can use your arrow keys no so we'll just pick something close 23 okay click repeat weekly and then send that off Again, it's wheat. I'm, I'm, I would rather send bread. And as you can see, it's going to send. Now, this goes for all resources that you move manually in your empire. It will always send out a little convoy truck like this. You can see him there. So that's carrying the wheat. You, you can't hover over them and see what's in the truck because as a campaign goes along, you're going to have a lot of trucks out in the field. You can't hover over this and see what's in there. So this truck is going to automatically follow the roads all the way up to Allendorf where we sent the, um, the weekly transport. Actually, I did that wrong. I need to redo that. I'm so sorry. So you need to come up here and pick your city. So I didn't choose Allendorf. This is, that's going to Mataro. So you want to go to Allendorf, get as close as you can. So 23 repeat weekly and then send that. And then, so a week now, a week from today at eight o'clock in the morning, as you can see down here, your date and time at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, so a week from now at eight o'clock in the morning, it's going to send another truck with 23 wheat to Allendorf. So as you can see, it's going to send another truck because we have another convoy. Okay. So that's going to M Mataro or wherever. I don't know where it's going. It doesn't matter. So that transport truck is going to go to Allendorf and then that's going to drop it off. Um, so that's what you have to do if you want to play on medium. And if you think about it, you have to do that with every one of your cities. So here in this port city, there have a, they have a weekly intake of seven. And if you're going to do that, can you, I don't know if you guys can see that with the camera. I'm thinking about turning my camera off so you guys can see that. I think you did. So as you can see, we have a lot of cities. So you would have to micromanage each one of these cities to have a food convoy to be able to feed them. And you, if your if your city isn't getting enough food, you're going to get a little red icon and you can hover over. It's not, it's hard to miss. You would notice it right away. Uh, if you were looking at the city, like you would, you would notice it would say, um, starving population, or it'll give you some sort of warning that you don't have enough food. So you'd have to make enough food convoys 
weekly convoys to each one of your cities. And this is early mid game. Like there's still about half of the map to uncover. So you can, you can quickly understand why that would get very tedious. Another point is that populations change and you're going to be changing food consumption. So let's say in Allendorf, because we're picking on that city. So Allendorf is 21 weekly. If they gain population, you're going to have to send more food, which means you're going to have to redo the supply truck for that. Let's say they lose population and they're bringing in maybe 18 food per week and you're still sending that 21 food per week. That means that you're having food here, not doing anything. So you're still sending 21. They only require 18, let's say, because they lost population. So now you're wasting three food. It's going to be stored in Allendorf, not being used. It's not going to rot or go bad or anything, but it's it's just sitting there not being used when it could probably go somewhere else. So you would have to set your convoys and then you would also have to recheck them probably every few months to make sure that you're sending the proper amount. You would know when you're sending not enough because your citizens would start to starve. And once you have starving citizens, your stability goes down very quickly. Like a starving population, you want to make sure you're taking care of that right away, freaking ASAP. So I just find that totally unnecessary. Like I said, there's food here in Verma. I have enough. Just let them have it. I don't need to micromanage and make and make convoys for every single city. I just, I don't, for me, I don't enjoy that at all. It just slows down the game and I don't think it's necessary. Maybe if you were low on food and you wanted to prioritize each city, um, where you're kind of like rationing out food and you want to determine who's getting what and how much. But other than that, I mean, we have the food, let them have it, let them eat their cake and have it too. So that's the medium, uh, resource management. If we go to medium realistic, the production of goods is only possible, uh, in necessary resources. The production of goods is possible only if the necessary resources are available in the city. So like I, I talked to, like I talked about before, again, in Allendorf, we're making seven, six, two rounds. We need to make sure that every 12 hours we need to have two iron. I mean, you could dump a hundred iron in here and forget about it. Eventually it'll run out and then you'd have to send more. Um, so you just need to make sure you have the resource of the thing that you're building. Let's go to Sonder. So Sonder, Saunders making what? So Saunders making two sets of different rounds. So it's taking for the 25 millimeter, it's taking three iron and one copper. And these 20 millimeters are taking two iron and one copper. So you need to make sure you have five iron and two copper every time while well, these are separate. So, I mean, it, they're going to come off the queue at different times. The point is you just need to make sure you have the resources in Saunders you're going to have to make sure you have copper and iron in Sonder to build those resources. And again, I just find that tedious. I mean, like I have the resources, just let them have it. I don't want to make weekly convoys. I don't want to do the math of, okay, every 12 hours, you know, in Allendorf, every 12 hours we're making, well, this is 96 hours. I don't know. You'd have to, I guess we just came off the queue. Yeah, we have 2000 here. So you'd have to see the max time. You I mean, you, again, you could just send maybe 50 iron and just let it run out. Uh, either way, I just find it tedious. And when you go to, and you would have to do that for each one of your production queues. We're kind of early on. We don't have a lot in production. A lot of it's just ammunition. And we have some Bradleys being made down here. But again, this is this is early middle games. So this is only about half the Island. So you can probably triple this and you're going to, as you unlock more units, you're going to have more things to build. So this is, this would be easy to maintain right now, but as the game goes on, it just, it's again, for me, it's too tedious to do. And just, we have the resources, just let them have it. So that's if you play on realistic. So, Expert construction of buildings is only necessary is only, Oh my God. I just got off work. So I'm having a hard time reading. 
construction of buildings only if all necessary resources are available in the city. So that goes the same with production, except we're just changing it to the buildings. We're going to go to our construction tab here. We'll look at Allendorf just because we're, I just want to keep things consistent. Like we said before, <laughs> it's going to take $4,000, 45 wood and 25 stone to build a sawmill in Allendorf. So we would have to come to, we would have to find those resources somewhere in our empire and bring them to Allendorf, make sure they're in the inventory, send the convoy, you know, go in, find your money, you know, go to 4,000 or as close to pick your city up here. So we're on Allendorf already. Um, don't click any of these and then just send it and then do that again for your stone and your wood or whatever it costs. I can't remember. And whatever it costs to make a sawmill, make sure those resources are in Allendorf. And then once they're there, you're able to build <clears throat> to me again, <laughs> it's tedious because we have the resources. Just let them have it. I don't want to make convoys and slow the game down. It's just one more thing to worry about that. I don't need to worry about. It's, it's totally unnecessary for me. Maybe some people want to play with that sort of, you, they want to micro their empire with everything. And that's totally fine. It's just, that's just not for me. And that's why I play on easy uh, resource management because I, I don't find it makes the game. If I played on, I, I don't find playing the game on expert resource management makes the game any harder. It just makes it more tedious. That's all it does. It, do it doesn't make the game for me any more difficult or makes me change my strategies around or makes me look at the game in a different meta. All it does is make me have to click the mouse more. That's it. So I, I don't find it necessary. And another thing to note is that the higher you go up the difficulty, like realistic stacks, medium and expert stacks, realistic and medium. So, you know, you'd have to worry about food, like everything. It's just too much, too much for me. Maybe there's some people who won't want to play with that and that's, that's fine too. So I wanted to go over that because that is a, that's going to change the way that you play drastically. Okay. So subtitles, that's pretty self-explanatory, uh, highlighting the enemy. So I keep mine on over hover. I think you can, yeah, you can always do it. That's a bit too x-ray vision for me. I have it on hover and I find that levels the playing field considering the AI has pinpoint accuracy through a forest with no line of sight. <laughs> like it's just, you could be running through a forest and just get pinged off by an enemy, you know, hiding in a building somewhere 200 meters away. So I find it makes it easier to spot the enemy. Cause when you're, when you're behind a bush or you're, you're running through a forest and you're taking fire. It, it's hard to get clear lines of sight in a long distance. So I find that it, I find it evens out the playing field. They get to cheat. So give me a little bit of a, you know, something to take the edge off number of units. That is just the amount of units you have available to spawn in at a battle. So 200 is max, which is going to be 10 units. Um, those 10 units, like a vehicle would count as one unit and that vehicle could have 10 units on it. So a vehicle is one, it would have 10 infantry support as attached to it. So 200 is just the max number of units you can have. And that goes with the enemy. So if you have, if you're able to put 10 units down on the field, the enemy is allowed to put 10 units on the field, as long as they are available. I mean, if the, if the enemy only has two units in their battalion, obviously they're only going to be able to, to spawn in two units. So I like to keep this on max cause it, it puts more units on makes, you know, it's yeah, more, yeah, more units to play with pretty much Uh lifespan of decals, blood decals and corpses. That's just stuff on the map. Like it's pretty self-explanatory. I just keep mine on default. I'm sure the longer you have this up, the more difficult it's going to be on your system. So that's totally pers personal preference here. So that goes over the options. I think I've gone over everything in great detail. <laughs> I think this is going to be a very long video. So let's move on to resources. So resources, you have this top bar, and this is going to show you all of your building resources and your food and your fuel 
and your oil and alcohol. So we'll go through it. So we have gold ore, iron ore, money, wood, stone, copper ore, wheat, meat, cotton, oil, bread, canned meat, canned food, alcohol, wood boards, cloth, fuel, iron, aluminum, copper, gold, and aluminum ore. Your top of your bar might not look exactly like this. Sometimes it changes everything around randomly. I don't know why. I mean, you would think it would have all the ore together and then all your ingots together. But anyways, I'm going off on a rant. It might not look the same and mine changes pure periodically. I don't know what does it, but uh, you're going to have all those resources up there as long as you have them. I mean, if you don't have any canned meat, that won't be here. Like it's not going to be a canned meat and a zero. It just won't be up there. So, uh, so we're going to, so your gold, we'll go over the raw materials first. So gold ore, iron ore, uh, copper ore here and aluminum ore. You need to process those into these ingots here. So iron, aluminum, copper, and gold, pretty self-explanatory. And the way you do that is through construction. So you have, uh, iron mines here. One thing to note with the iron mines is you cannot build mines. The resources that are on the map, like these wheats, um, these copper mines, uh, this aluminum ore here, what else? This oil, everything that you can see, like this oil here, all the raw materials, I guess you could say, because oil is a raw material that is built into fuel. You can't do anything with oil. You have to refine it into fuel for it to be useful. So you could think of oil as, you know, iron ore, an unprocessed material. So unprocessed materials are randomly put on the map each time you load a new game. So you can't say, well, I want to play this faction because they start off with copper ore. I could start a new game and this could be oil or anything else, any other raw material, which is gold ore, iron ore, aluminum ore, oil, or copper ore. Uh, you're not in these farm cities. So as you can see, the little farm icon here, you're always going to have wheat there. I'm pretty sure I could be wrong. Let's double check the map and see if there's wheat on another farm tile. I don't think so. I just don't want to give you guys bad information. So now it looks like all these farms have wheat in them. Okay. So just looking to see if all farms have wheat or if there's farms on the map that don't. doesn't look like it. So all your farms are always going to produce wheat and you'll always start off with at least one wheat tile or one reason, one wheat resource in your, well, every, every province has a wheat field, I guess you could say. So, and you can tell the provinces by these borders here. So that was this, a faction at the beginning of the beginning of the game controlled this province here. Our starting province was up here. This border here follows all the way around. So we started off with wheat, copper ore, and that's it. So again, you can load the game up all and wherever you see the raw material, it'll be different every time you load up the game. So you can say, well, I really want to play this faction and I really want to start off with iron ore. You can do that. You just have to reload the game until it happens. Just keep restarting because eventually you'll get iron ore. It might take 10 times, but eventually you'll get it. So, and that goes with the rest. So you, you know, you can't really plan out your attack being like, I'm going to start off he here with copper ore. And I know this faction has aluminum ore. So I'm going to go down there first because this is going to be different again, next time you load it. So you have to keep that in mind as well. All the raw material being produced is going to be different. So you need to turn your ore into ingots and your oil into fuel. You need to, so you have cotton here, cotton, you turn into cloth and you do all, well, let's go through this. Okay. So cotton turns into cloth. Uh, wood turns into wood boards, wheat turns into bread and alcohol. You can do both with wheat. Uh, stone is a raw material that you don't turn it into anything. 
Uh, it, it's a raw material that you have to mine. You're not going to get stone in the map in the beginning like you do with aluminum ore. You actually have to go into your uh, construction queue and build a stone pit. So you would build that here. You click on that, build the stone pit. We'll cancel that construction. But So that's the only way you can get stone, even though it's a raw material. Because you don't, once you, stone doesn't, it's not like wheat where you turn it into something else or you have the option to, it's just stone is stone, that's it. Uh, you have meat here, meat you can eat. So you can eat raw wheat and meat. It's not ideal, you're not going to get the same benefit or bonuses to your population from, like you're not going to feed them as efficiently with those. So you turn wheat into bread and meat turns into canned goods. And again, you have to do that in your construction queue. So there should be, so you have canning factory here. So you would just build that. Um, also here we have, so I start Luango, Luang, Lungano started off with a wheat tile. So I built a bakery here. Um, so now we're, we're building bread. One thing to note is that you cannot build oh, here. We're going off topic here. That's a whole production queue. We, I don't want to get into that right now. And that is about it for your, so you have money. You can hover over these. You can hover over this and see exactly where it's being used. Uh, so we have iron ingots. So right now we are our iron ingots. We have a consumption of 15. It's not telling me the city but for a production of those are Bradley's. So I can just tell by, so down here in Verma. So they're being used in Verma. Um, you can tell where they're being produced. So Verma's producing aluminum. Let's see. Let's look for Verma. So Verma's producing an aluminum mine. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure what those numbers mean. Like where it's showing 102 in Compelios. Maybe that's where it is. That's where we have aluminum. Okay, so that's showing where the aluminum is. So that's something I just learned right now. So Compelios 102, that means I have 102 aluminum in this city. And if I go to Verma, yeah, I should have should have 470 of them. Cause that's where most of our resources are. Yeah. 470. So that's what that means. Okay. Same with fuel cloth. So it shows you where that resource is in each city. So that's good to know. And it'll also tell you the consumption of it too. Like our iron that's, so we have minus two production. Um, it's not telling, again, it's not telling us the city, but it's telling us how much we're going through. So we're going through like 35, one, two, what, 44, 46, 48. So we're going through about 50 iron for all that production. There's not going to be a time on it because some things take longer to build than others. But we need at least 50 iron ingots to build everything in that queue at least once. So let's talk about how you turn these resources into what you need. So you need iron ore to make iron ingots. Okay. So how you do that, we're going to go in our construction tab. You need, so now this is another point to make that what I'm doing is playing on easy resource management. So I can build my iron mine anywhere and I don't need to worry about having iron in the, in the city that I have my iron mine for it to be productive. I could put my iron mine in Podenza and it'll take the iron ore from the global pool and use it for that iron mine. Now, if you're playing on the higher difficulties for resource management, you would have to build your iron mine in a place where you have, you would have to build your, sorry, your steel plant. It's confusing. It says a steel plant. You're making, 
but you're making iron. So it, it should say an iron plants. I don't know. So steel plant produces uh, 10 iron every production queue. So you would have to put your steel plant with your iron mine so that you don't, or you could, I mean, if you're playing on the higher difficulties, you could build it in Podenza, but you would have to make supply convoys from your iron mine city to Podenza to make sure you have that constant feed of iron ore for your mine. But uh, it wouldn't, that would be kind of silly. So what you would, if you, if possible, you should be building on the higher resource management difficulties. You should be kind of specializing your cities to produce certain resources. So like here we have iron mines. You probably want to build a steel plant here. We have a gold mine. You're probably going to want to build a gold plant here. Same with your wheat fields again on higher difficulty resource management. here. I just built it next to here because I don't know. It didn't matter really. Uh, but if you're playing on higher difficulties, you're probably going to want to put your bakery because your bakery produces a hundred bread from wheat. So you would want to, you know, make a bakery where you're producing your wheat. And my understanding, I don't have the exact numbers. Somebody wrote a comment in my, um, one of my videos sometimes and gave me the actual numbers for this, but don't quote me on this. I think it's two bakeries per one wheat field. Now I could be wrong on that. I don't have the exact numbers. If somebody does let me know in the comments, but my understanding is if you put two bakeries per one wheat field, you're going to be okay. So let's keep going down the queue. We have a stone pit here. We don't need to worry about it. So we have, again, we conquered a city that had an oil derrick in it. So on higher difficulties, the smart thing to do would be to put the refinery there. I put the refinery here because I just like, like things neat and tidy for me on the easy resource management, um, difficulty, I could put this refinery in, you know, in a different city and it would just pull that fuel from our global pool. It would, it would pull the oil from our global pool to refine in whatever city our refinery was in. So we have a, the kind of, um, the, that kind of explains what, how you refine, um, your raw materials. And as you can see, you have plenty of options. So you turn your wheat into bread, you turn tobacco which I don't have a tobacco field you'd have to build. So you can only build tobacco fields on farms. So as you can see, it opened up the tobacco field here, uh, on one of our military factory cities. I don't know what that Bilio is. As you can see, we're going a bit off topic, but I, I kind of have to explain this stuff as we go along. So these, these little icons here, as you can see, like the house is clumped together. So that's your capital city. Here you have the little garage. That's an industrial city. You have your anchor. So that's your port, the little barn here. So that's one of your farm cities. And down here you have another industrial city. So you can't build mines or can you, let me double check that before I give you bad information. So Luongo is a farm city, right? I can't build mines here. I, I can't build a copper, a copper plant in a farm tile. I think you can only build those in your, um, industrial cities. Like this is an industrial city here. You can tell because it has the military factories. Um, anything that starts off with a farm ports. Yeah. It doesn't look like you can build mines in a port as well. So you can only really build your industrial capacity. I guess you could say in your cities, like your, your industrial centers, with the little garage icon here, not in the farm. I get your capital cities like Podenza. Let's check that out. So Podenza, you can build, I think, I think in your capital cities. So the, the icon up here. So this is the capital of this province of this border. So all these three cities here, the port and here you can see the border. So the capital city, 
you can build a bank and a research center. You can't build those anywhere else. You can't build them on farmlands, only on capital cities. Uh, so that's one thing to know too. You, you can build these two buildings on your capital, but if you want to build a tobacco factory, you have to build it on a farm. Right. So I want to, I, I wanted to go over the buildings actually. So you have bread, you have your bakery, you have your tobacco factory, which is you need tobacco for. So you'd have to come down to one of your farms, build tobacco. You have your canning factory, your logging plant. You need, there's, so logs or wood. I don't know what it is. What is it? Yeah, wood. You, that's a raw material that is not going to spawn on the map like these other raw materials here. It's kind of like, it's like stone. Stones are raw, these two wood and stone are raw materials that are not <clears throat> going to spawn on the map in any city. So you have to come in here and actually build a logging plant to get that wood. And then you need to build a sawmill to turn, cause you can't do anything with wood. Uh, you need to turn it, you need to turn it into wood boards. As you can see, wood boards times five, you need to turn it into wood boards from the sawmill. So you need to work both. So you need to build both. Um, you have military factories. I, I'm going to, I don't want to go too deep into the screen because I want to talk about this later, but um, yeah, so that's how you turn your resources into that's how you, that's how you refine resources into useful items that you can build with. One thing to note is that you need to be careful in the early game, what you're building because you don't like, as you can see, the steel plant takes 75 wood boards, 95 stone. So if you build a couple mines, you're almost going to soft lock yourself because you, again, you need, you, you're not going to get any stone from you need a stone pit to produce stone. You're not going to find it out in the world. Same with wood boards, which means you also need a logging plant. So you build a couple of mines, you run out of stone. You're like, oh damn, now I can't build the logging plant. Or now I need 45 wood boards for a stone pit because I don't have any stone because I used it building, you know, two mines or two, uh, I built an aluminum plant and a steel plant somewhere. I got no stone, but oh man, I can't build stone because I, I haven't built the sawmill yet. So we'll go to the sawmill. I need 25 stone. Well, that sucks. So I wanted to build a stone pit. I can't because I need 45 boards. Damn it. So let's go to the logging plant. Well, I need 35 stone. So you can almost soft lock yourself to where you can't build anything to help you build anything in the future. You can go into the trade you can go into trading. There's not going to be anything here because we're at war with everybody, but you can go into the trade and hopefully find the resources that you're looking for, but it's not a guarantee. You're not always going to get stone and wood boards and logs here. So, I mean, maybe if you went into diplomacy and got like trading, the more trading agreements you have, the more options you're going to have in trading. We'll talk about that later, but it's not guaranteed. So you can really slow down your progress if you don't plan out your buildings, what I like to do personally is I like to get my food situated because food is most important. And then I'll build a uh, logging. What would I build first? You start off with wood boards. I'm pretty sure I could be wrong, but I would, I would definitely, I would definitely get these three buildings built first somewhere in the empire. And then I don't have to worry about it. Because also, it's not going to be guaranteed, even when you're conquering territory, that the that the enemy's going to, excuse me, that the enemy's going to have these built. So I'll just build these three right away, and then I don't have to worry about it. Then I can go into, you know, my steel plants, and even if I run out of stone, I know I have some coming eventually. And if if possible, I'll go into trade to try and boost up. Uh, try and, you know, supplement some of the stuff that I'm missing. So you got to be really cautious with, with what you're building and when, at least in the, in the early game, cloth is pretty much only used for, uh, I don't want to get this wrong. 
it's only built for a few things, uniforms and I think first aids. Yeah. So cloth isn't a big resource, but cotton is a raw resource that you're not going to find on the map again. So you need to I keep clicking on the wrong thing. You need to actually build a cotton field. So if you come into one of your farm tiles, it'll give you the cotton field here. And then you can build the Garmin factory, luckily in the same farm tile, if you're playing on those higher difficulties. But I think you can build a Garmin factory anywhere. I could be wrong. Yeah, here's here's a military city, and you can. Same with um, anything else up here. If it's a raw material, the only, again, I'm going to, the only thing you can't, the only raw material you can't refine into something else is stone. Everything else can be uh, refined into something somehow through your construction queue. And again, you have to make sure you're picking the right tile. You're not going to be able to build wheat fields or, or in your military uh, areas. You can build everything else, like your canning facility or your bakery. I don't know if you'd want to build a bakery here. Cause you kind of want to keep, cause you can't, I'll, I'll usually, st even though I'm on easy resource management, I'll still keep all my food in the farm cities. Cause you're kind of limited on what you can build in the farm city. Like I don't want to use a bakery tile here when I have other options like the bank or the resource center or any of these ones that aren't available in your farm tiles. So you kind of want to keep all of your food based in your farm tile tile. Uh, farm cities, even if you're playing on easy resource management, just because you don't want to take up a precious, you know, mining, like aluminum plant slot, because, you know, you put a bakery there when you could have put it in here when I can't even build one of those here anyway. So I think that's it for resources. So we're going to move down to the bottom left screen here. All right, so next we're going to talk about the bottom left screen here. So you have five symbols. You have your faction flag, which is nothing. You have stability, authority, political power, and dictatorship. Now, I'm going to be totally honest here. I don't really know what these two things do, your authority and your political power. I know in random events, I always get the option to increase or decrease my political power and my authority, but I really don't know what they do. Same with dictatorship. I know I get, you'll get random events where you can increase or decrease this number very slowly. It's only usually 1% or something, but I, I really don't know what they do. Dictatorship, I think is higher on communism factions and probably monarchy factions. I don't, I don't know for sure. So as the faction we are now, we're actually a democracy. So we don't want a high dictatorship. It might affect stability or authority. I don't really know, to be honest. All I know is that it doesn't really affect gameplay that I've noticed. What will affect your gameplay and something that, and I could be wrong. Maybe someone can let me know in the comments to explain exactly what these things represent and what they do and what they affect. But one thing I can tell you is your stability down here. Mine's at 12%, which is good for me, <laughs> really, especially in a, a, you know, we're at war with everybody. Usually uh, the more territory you conquer, the lower your stability. But anyhow, so stability, the following gives a stability bonus. So police detachments in cities and products like food and alcohol. So you can if make sure your cities are well fed and also you can make alcohol again through here. I don't know if you can build it on a farm city. No. So we'll just go here. So this distillery, you can build one of these. It's going to take some wheat and produce, um, alcohol. And again, on the easy resource management difficulty, it's just going to take that alcohol and spread it out throughout the land out of the global pool. If not, if you're playing on a higher difficulty, you would have to send that alcohol out to each city or at least cities that had low law and order. As you can see at the bottom of that little tool tip here, it says law and order established. So, you know, I don't know if you would really need alcohol there. Another way 
you can increase stability as well is as it says there is through police detachments in cities or a garrison or a battalion that has taken place in a city so verma here has 16 troops this is the actual fighting battalion so they're they're kind of they're like a temporary because they're not going to be here for the whole game they're squashing they're raising stability being there uh, if you come to fiskadel here we have so if you click on the city go to garrison up here you're, it's going to show you the garrison unit that's here one garrison is not a lot if you really wanted to garrison your cities you would want to have at least five or more so you would have to make sure you had the appropriate resources to build those garrisons here and we'll go over that later um troop management uh so you're going to have to make sure that you have the proper resources here even on easy management easy resource management to build enough garrison units to keep the city uh happy or raise stability i don't have a lot of garrisons i don't really use them so that's that's a lot of the reason why my stability is so low because personally i find we can try and build a garrison verma we should be able to so verma we have garrison you would come in here you would click on create uh create a police squad so this mp it doesn't really yeah police detachments in cities garrisons so i guess you want to build police so you'd click on mp they have a police uniform because we have police uniforms here like all of our resources are here so we should have yeah we have 313 uniforms so we should be able to have 313 police in the city if we wanted that many that's a lot so you would just build those garrisons and they would just build like any other force you would just unpause the game and it would slowly um it would slowly fill up the manpower and everything else so it does take time me personally I find this extremely tedious and an extreme waste of resources because it's pulling out from your, your it's pulling out from everything else. So your, your supply here, all of your weapons and ammo and manpower, you know, you only have a certain amount of manpower. We have a lot, but it's going to take all the resources to build your garrison units and really you should have about five or more units if you had five or more units in each one of your cities your stability would probably be pretty good but again you got to think of the 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 resources that it's taking to do that as you can see how many cities do we have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven you know eleven already we still have half so times all of your cities times five that's how many that's how much equipment and resources it's going to take to garrison you know with garrison enough to make your stability uh rise up again to me that is a big waste of resources and time and energy what i usually do is i'll just build if possible I'll just build a rebel fighting squad of at least about 10. It doesn't have to be very strong. It, it's got to be, you know, a reasonable strength squad with some reasonable equipment. And I'll just hold them back and they can squash any rebellions that come up as they do. At least in this game, you don't have a lot. We do have rebels here, as you can see. And you'll get a notification when these things come up. You'll get a little up. A random event will come up and it'll ask you how you want to deal with it and it'll ask you what you want to what resources you want to sacrifice like money or it you'll you'll see that when it when that reason when the random event comes up you'll see that and then no matter what you press you're going to get rebels so the rebels will pop up you go kill them and they're your stability usually raises up um so that's what I do. I just build a squad of 10, make a rebel fighting squad and just squash them as they come up. They'll come up periodically, but you're not going to be, for the most part, rebels don't spam out. So you're not going to be worrying about it a lot. Like 
even if you're stable, I've had my stability up at zero. Once you kill a few rebels that come up, it'll be fine at, you know, 12 or 20. You know, you, you shouldn't have to worry about it. It's a lot less intensive than just building garrisons in each city. So that's stability. That'll help with your rebel squashing. They are annoying, but they're easy to deal with. And they're usually not that big. I mean, seven is about average size for a rebel squad. And they do sometimes have some decent units in them. So you do want to make a rebel fighting squad that is able to handle something with decent equipment. As you can see, they do have, you know, I, I can't really tell. It looks like a LAV or something in there. You can tell by the Sprite, the vehicle. And also by the symbol, you know, they have mechanized units in there. So, you know, you don't want to just send infantry at them because you're probably going to lose. So I think that's it for these bottom icons. All right. Now we're going to look at the bottom center here. So this is your time and date. So right now it is the 18th of May, 2029 at 1700 hours, which is. Oh. What's 1700 hours? 16 is four. So it'd be five o'clock, right? If you're ever curious on military time, just take the number and subtract five. And that's what time it is or subtract 12. Sorry. It'll be five o'clock at 1700 hours. So if you're ever worried about military time, if it's 1600 hours, just take away 12. It's four o'clock. Same with if it's 1300 hours, take away 12. 13 take away 12, 1. 20 take away 12 is 8. So it's 8 o'clock, if, if anyone's curious on how military time works. So it is, yeah, it's May 18th, 2029 at 5 o'clock. Right down here, you have your pause, game speed 1 and game speed 3. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if you're at war, I wouldn't, with a faction that is close to you, I wouldn't recommend... Um, game speed three, unless you're actually looking at the faction, making sure that you're looking when they move. Cause at game speed three, they could, this battalion here could make it to Rasvet in two seconds. It would be at a blink of an eye. So you want to make sure that you're playing at a, if a difficult or playing at a game speed that is appropriate for the situation that you're in. Because if, if you're not looking here and you're at game speed three, you're going to they're going to attack Razvet, and you're not even going to notice, especially if you have units n nearby and you want to kind of garrison area. You know, you kind of want to uh, make sure that even on game speed one, you need to you need to keep an eye on the enemy because they will move without warning. And if I'm looking over here, doing something over here on game speed one, I mean, it'll take them one second to get here on game speed three, but it only takes three seconds for them to get there on game speed one. <coughs> Excuse me. So. You're going to want to, you know, again, play to the speed appropriate for the situation and always just press space to pause the game. And that's pretty much it for time. All right. Now we're going to talk about each one of these um, buttons and it's going to, <laughs> it's going to be an extensive talk. I've kind of went over some of it in with some of the other, uh, with some of the other things we've been explaining, but we're going to go into, we're going to go into detail in each one of them right now. So right now, right here, you have your manufacturing adaptation, fancy word for research. So click on that. You have your research research queue. One thing to note is you have your times here. So we started off late in the game and we have mostly everything like as you, it's 2029. So we have most of everything unlocked. I think the only thing that's not unlocked is that one queue. So in 2031, that's going to open up on January 1st, 2021. That's going to open up and we'll be able to research here. Otherwise, everything else is open. Late in the game, we started, I think we started this campaign in 2028 because that's the latest starting date you can start. The earliest starting date you can start, I think is 2023. I could be wrong on those dates, but there is an early start. You can adjust the start date that your campaign starts at, at the beginning of the game. And we can go over that um, later on. 
So we started off late. So a lot of this stuff was already unlocked, but we've also played a year. So even on the late start date, you're going to have guns that are locked behind um, a tech year. And there's no way to fast forward this. You, you have to wait until 2031 until this will unlock. And when you start the game, you're going to have, especially on an early date, a lot of this stuff. I think you start off with the first two uh, weapon queues open and then the rest of them are locked. Same with your vehicles. I think you start off with the first two open and the rest are locked. Not sure about the Air Force. This is pretty new to the game. So it'll be, I know some of it will be locked off, definitely. The only thing that is open to everybody at on day one, even on the earliest start, is your ammunition screen. Everybody can research this right away. I mean, you still have to go down the queue. So if you want to get 762 rounds down here, you have to research this one, go down the line to this, and then down here. You can't, like if I, so this isn't researched yet. I can't come down here and research that. I can click on it and it'll make the queue, but I still need to research the corresponding line. So you have to keep that in mind when you're kind of building and planning out your what you want to build in the future. Also, all fat, <coughs> excuse me, I haven't talked this much in a long time <laughs> or explained something this detail for a long time. All your ammunition for all factions, because each faction within reason, I'll just compare communism and uh, democracy. Those two factions are going to be using totally different equipment, which uses totally different ammunition. But all ammunition for all factions are on this screen. So you need to make sure that you're researching the right ammunition for the right um, weapons and vehicles that you're going to be using. Unfortunately, you cannot see what the vehicle or weapon uses until you unlock it. So if you're like, oh, I really want to use Uggs late in the game, I don't, um, well, unless you're a gun expert and you kind of know what ammunition it uses, I, I don't know. So you could, might be able to kind of guess what it is, but it doesn't tell you what it uses only until you are able to research it. So as you can see, M16s are completed here. We researched those already. It tells me what ammunition it uses. So now I can look at the XM8s. It takes 5.56 by 49 millimeter. It gives you a little description there as well about the history of the rifle. Um, I can't tell what the G36s are. Also, I can't research this yet because I need to research the M at the XM8s. So 5.56 by 45, go to ammunition. 5.56 five, by 45. So this is the ammunition it uses. We've already researched it, so that's good. Once you research something, it will be available in your production queue. So 5.56 five, by 45 is right here. We've researched it. It's in our production. It's, it's in our available production. We still have to you know put it in a production queue and wait for it to be built. But that only the stuff that you research are available in your production. So we can go back here. Um, vehicles, it's the same. I don't know what ammunition Leopard, Leopard 2 takes. So you're kind of guessing on what it uses. I don't know how realistic it is on the ammunition here. Maybe it's, maybe you know what the, tank uses in real life and it's in here and that's what it uses i don't know so it's kind of guesswork unless you really know the game um so you have to kind of keep that in mind air force you're going to have stuff locked out and that's only because that's for another faction i'm not going to be able to use b2 bombers i have used b2 bombers before but i think i was i don't know what faction i was i'm surprised it's not with democracy because you would think that's what um what they would use. I think this faction's a, a, a democracy. By the weapons here, maybe not. I don't know. I don't remember what faction I am, to be quite honest. You So your weapons, your small arm weapons are going to be di different according to the factions. So communists are going to be using different weapons than the uh, democracy factions. So that's that 
is the one thing that really adds flavor to the game is all the ammunition is available to every to whatever faction you're playing the screen will never change the only thing is you want to make sure you're researching the right ammunition but this screen your weapon screen your vehicle screen will be different because you're going to be having use of different vehicles i think we're a democracy because democracy uses humvees and these um these vehicles so i think that's what we are so if you played as a communist you're going to have a different screen here with different weapons same with the vehicles you're going to have different weapons and air force this screen will be the same but you're going to have these little locked icons will be on different areas. I don't think you have these attack helicopters when you're communist. So that's that's one thing to keep in mind. That's pretty much it for research. The only thing is you need to wait for the appropriate year for them to be unlocked. And like I said before, the earlier you start your game, the more is going to be locked out. The one thing that I can kind of say one thing that I would recommend, so we're going to go through a hype, not a hype of, we're going to go through a situation that I'm going through pretty much every game. So let's say we start at an early date and we only have these two production, these two research lines available for our product for research. All of these lines here are locked out. So when I look at this, and so again, as you can see, these are all going to be grayed out. They're going to have a little triangle. It might say 2025 here, 2027, 2028, 2030 here, and 2031. I don't know what the exact dates are, but just for an example, just for argument's sake, I, I they will have dates. I just don't know when they unlock. I can't remember. But sometimes it's one year, sometimes it skips two years. Um, so one thing that I like to do, and it's always the same year, so the 2031, this will all be the same year. So just keep that in mind as well. It's not like this is going to unlock in 2025, and then this unlocks in 2026. That all The whole line is the same year. So one thing to keep in mind is that stuff takes time to build, and you're not going to be able to research everything with the time allotted that you have. I don't know when the end date is for this game or if there is one. I don't know if you only have until, you know, 2035 and the game automatically ends. I don't know. But I've I've com I've conquered the whole map before I've been able to research everything. Maybe that's just my playstyle. You might be able to play a slower game more democracy, more diplomacy, or just not, you know, go all out for your campaign and you're able to research everything. But again, you're not, you want to streamline your production as much as possible because stuff takes a lot of time. Tanks can take over three months, four months to build one tank. So you got to keep that in mind as well. So what I do personally is I'll look at my screen. I can look at this and say, even though it's grayed out, I'm like, okay, I know the Bradleys are here and I know the tanks are here. And I'll say, I know leopards are tanks. Also, because it tells you, even though this is blacked out, 2031, it's a K2. 2031, Abram X, I know that's a tank. So you, I kind of know what's coming up, even though it's grayed out. So I'll look at this and say, well, I don't need two lines of infantry fighting vehicles. So I'll go down this line. I'm going to tell, I'm going to restart here. I'm going to tell you my thought process on a typical campaign that I usually do. So I'll look at the production queue. I usually like to start early, uh, early on in the game. So these two will be unlocked. I'll usually come down to the M wraps because it, it's a closed turret system for one, the, the M wraps better than the Humvee in the sense that, there's somebody sitting up in this turret, and if they get smoked, you're going to have to replace that body with somebody else. Otherwise, the vehicle, it's not going to automatically do it. So, And you have to have the infantry for it. So if your infantry gets wiped out and you have no one to replace anybody in that turret gunner, it's pretty much a wasted vehicle unless you manually take it over. But when you have 10 units, sometimes you know you got you don't want to deal with that. So the MRAPS is a closed, closed turret system. So... 
I would usually come down here and build those. I would skip this line and then I would skip this line because the striker is pretty much an upgraded MRAP. It's got higher uh, hit points, but it's still just a closed system, smaller. It's a 12.799. I think these are the same. It's the same small arm weapon, knowing that the Bradleys are coming up next. So I, the LAVs are nice, but the LA, the Bradleys outshine the LAVs in combat. Uh, these are a bit faster, but these have a coax, they have a main gun, and they have a that you're able to fire two missiles. I don't know what they're called. It doesn't show up there. So it's interesting that it actually has three weapon systems and it's only showing two. The LAV has only two weapon systems. They're good units, but the Bradley is better in every single way, except for speed, in my opinion. So I don't need to worry about researching down this line because if you think about it, we're going to unlock the MRAPs. The MRAPs are better, in my opinion, than anything else in here except the Vulcans, but the Vulcan is a totally different beast on its own. So I would research them, I would get them in the production queue with the ammunition, and then say, well, do I really want to, let's say I wanted the LAVs. So I would have to research the striker, which takes eight days. Then I would have to research the LAV, which takes 66 days. Then I would have to go into ammunition and I can't remember exactly what they use. I think they use these 30 millimeter rounds. I could be wrong. So anyways, you would have to research to the ammunition, which is going to take time because you're, you know, whether this is 20 days, 20 days, and 20 days, that's 60 days in research, just getting the production for your uh, ammunition. Plus you have to research the coax. The coaxial is 7.62 rounds. I think I'm not positive on that but i think it's these rounds here so again you're researching down this entire line and if we use this as an example which is probably on par with what we did here 16 days 16 days and 25 days so that's you know that's two months almost give or take a day so you're looking at two months plus probably three months here so five months just in ammunition research plus two months for the LAV research plus eight days. So, um, you know, you're looking at almost over half the year, just researching it. Then once you research it, you have to put it into your production. So let's say these were the LAVs. You would have to put them into production. God knows how long they're going to uh, build. So they could take up to, they're not going to take 3,300 hours because they're, they're quicker than the Bradley. So let's just say they take 2000 hours, which is probably generous for the LAV. I don't know how, I don't have the math on how many days, uh, 200 hours is, but you got to consider that into the build time because you're looking at all of your research time for the ammunition and the vehicle, then the production time to build one, mind you, unless you put more on the queue, but that all depends on your resource. Like these strikers, the, oh, like the strikers take, do I have them research right now? I don't, I, I do my later on. So let's say the Bradley, the Bradley takes 35 iron, 15 aluminum and five copper. That's a lot of resources and that's just for one. So you can only, it's not like you can spam out LAVs. You can only build as many as your resources will let you. Cause you got to keep in mind, you got to build your ammunition for it. So that costs iron and whatever else you're building. You know, you could be building, um, landing craft, which is resource heavy. Like you, you can't just spam out once you research it. Once I research LAVs, you can't just spam out and have, you know, five production queues of them because it's not sustainable. So you're only going to be building maybe one or two, maybe here. So we're pretending that this is the lab that we just researched. So you put two on the queue. It's going to take 2000 hours, uh, depending on the, if you have the resources for them. One thing to note that the resources are consumed when the, the unit is built. So when I put a thing on here, it didn't just take 35 
iron, 15 aluminum and five copper out of my inventory. Now it, it takes the resource when the 3,300 hours is up or whatever, how long it takes. Like this pistol is 120 hours. So it'll take the resources when that time is when the, when the units built. So three 3,300 hours from now around there, because time will change with the resource efficiency or production efficiency. That's when it takes the, the resource. So <laughs> my point is by the time you research, by the time the, the lab is unlocked, cause it's not going to be all, let's say it unlocks in 2027, let's say, and the Bradley's unlock in 2028 or even 2029. By the time you build what, by the time you research the ammunition, research the lav, build the lav, or as many as you can in the production queue, you're already probably one year in and you only have maybe one or two on the queue. And then all of a sudden you have Bradley's unlocked because you've, the time has passed. Like by the, so by the time you've researched everything, got everything in production, it's come off the production queue. You're already maybe four, maybe six months away from the Bradley's unlocking. So you've wasted all that time building a unit that is going to be obsolete by the time or close to that a better unit comes out. So what I like to do is I'll usually skip a year or two and build kind of plan out my builds for the whole game. So I, for me, I would do M wraps. I would skip these two years. And also you got to remember, you're going to be capturing vehicles from the enemy that are going to be sort of like your labs or your Bradley's, depending on what they're using, you're going to be capturing hopefully i mean if you do your battles correctly or or sometimes it's not possible but usually if they have vehicles you're going to capture one or two along the way as you progress but if not your your m wraps are going to be fine until you hit the bradley side i mean you can use infantry with rpgs or even with your captured vehicles, you'll be able to deal with these heavier units because an MRAP against an LEV is, I mean, you're going to get smoked, but so I would skip this queue and I would go right into Bradley's knowing that Bradley's can deal with tanks and then skip this leopard and go into the Abrams or even, you know, go to skip the research the Bradley with the M1 because then you kind of have your infantry fighting vehicle with your tanks or just go down to the M1 Abrams because the M1 Abrams can deal with any sort of like they're not that much better or it's not that much worse than these leopards so I would just skip these two cues and wait until I got the M1 Abrams I would skip the leopards probably skip this line because I'm not big on artillery. Again, that's personal preference. Maybe you want to build that. And then probably by 2031, I would build the Abram X because it, that would give me, you know, three, four years to get M1 A1 tanks out on the field. And that's plenty of time to get those out. So that's what I mean, how you want to plan out your vehicle production because you're not going to have time to build everything. You're going to want me personally, I would recommend skipping years and kind of planning out what you want to build. Um, because again, you're probably going to be capturing enemy vehicles like lavs or the heavy, uh, heavier equipment to deal with the heavier units because the, you're not going to win a battle with lavs with M wraps, but you know, for me, I've always been able to capture enemy units like all these tanks here. If you can look at my forces, like this lab, I didn't build this leopard. I didn't build, um, this M one, a one. I didn't build the Vulcan. I didn't build. That's the one unit. And as you can see, all these tanks, this tank, one, two. So I'm going to count all the units that I did not build one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So 10 units out of the 16, I didn't build. I've captured them 
through battle. So you don't need to, and that's what's kind of stopped me from even researching tanks because I'm getting them through the enemy. And really, if you've watched my series, if you've watched my series, especially this one, you know, I've wiped out 30 stacks with one or two tanks. You don't need to kit out a, you know, a max. You can have 30 units. So 30 units in a battalion max. Your each unit can have 10 infantry attached to it. Um, or it's just an infantry squad. So you would have, oh, it's giving me all. Anyways, so each unit is going to be 10 infantry squads, except if it's a vehicle, then you're going to have the one vehicle or the one, the vehicle plus 10 infantry. Um, my point was that you can only have 30 units, like 30 of these units here. When you look in, so this unit has 10 infantry attached to it. And you can see that through the 10 out of 10. This has three infantry, three out of 10. The max is 10. Each unit can have 10 units. Um, this has three out of 10 units. And you can click on them and see what they're using, their name, their uniform, the ammunition they have, if they have any RPGs, like here. So 10 units per battalion. But like I said, I can wipe out 30 stacks of enemy units with heavy um, mechanized units uh, i can destroy a heavy mechanized 30 stack enemy unit with one or two tanks i'll still bring my 22 stack but it if you play if you if you use tactics that kind of work against the ai you don't need 50 tanks and that's what i'm saying here i didn't build these tanks so you don't need to research everything. You don't need to worry about it. You can build and skip years because pr you're probably going to be capturing equipment from the enemy. So that for me, I went from, well, this was already unlocked. I think I went to strikers first because this was, no, I didn't because it's not unlocked. I don't know what I did. I think I did Bradley's first for this late start. Again, this is a late start game. So a lot of this this line was unlocked for me. I think this line was too. I think I had access to tanks right away, but I wanted Bradley's because I know Bradley's, I can build five Bradley's and deal with, Bradley's can deal with tanks. You know, if you, they can't go head to head with them. You need to, you know, maneuver around or, you know, use the terrain to your advantage. But, you know, like I said, with this series, if you've, if you watch it, I've taken out, you know, five or six tanks with one Bradley. You just have to, you know, use it in the proper way and use cover and uh, try and get behind them. And, you know, there's tactics to do that. So that's, that's a long winded explanation for my example on how to maybe plan out your, your research with your production. You got to keep in mind the time it takes to research it and put it in the production queue for it to be built. And then think about that for what you want to build in the future. So you don't need to build everything. For me, this M1A1, if I wasn't getting tanks from the, if I wasn't capturing tanks from the enemy, I would build this M1A1 and not even worry about these two lines and go once 31 hit, then I would probably research the Abram X and then that's, I mean, you can't get anything better than that for the democracy. I wouldn't really have to. The M1A1 would be fine. I mean, a tank is a tank. I mean, you could, it's all the, I'm going to say it's all the same. They do have different stats and different strengths in that. But I mean, again, the way I play, I can destroy probably 30 tank. Well, not 30, I'm trying to be a bit cocky there, but uh, a couple of tanks, I could destroy pretty much any army with with using proper cover and uh techniques to do that so but still abram x's i mean obviously i would just do it for the cool factor uh army and navy you don't really have to worry about that i mean there's no ammunition for the um air force you just do it unlock it 
and we'll talk about the Air Force later and the battle screen. Uh, landing craft as well. I've never really on played around with this, played around with the Navy. I don't know if there really is Navy battles. As you can see, I don't want to go off course. I have a landing craft here. Um, I've, I have never seen a enemy Navy, which it looks like you can build ships here. Like it looks like a little destroyer and that almost looks like an aircraft carrier. So I've never seen that. I've never built one, never seen one from the enemy. I don't know how sea battles would work if they're even in the game yet, or they're just placeholders for future updates. But um, by the looks of it, that's coming eventually. But as of now, these landing craft here, they just um, they just float around. You can clash, like you can't do any seaborne battles with these things. They're just troop transports. That's all they that's all they're good for. And I think that's it for technology. <laughs> I think I covered everything. Uh, I will touch on small arms. So this is just a recommendation as well. I mean, you don't need to research all of these. Like the FAL in practice would be fine. Like this is an early gun. You can unlock this pretty early in the game. Once you have that, you you put that into production, really, you don't need any of these weapons. This FAL is going to do you for the rest of the game. The only re I mean, you could unlock some of these light machine guns later on in the game. Yes, that's cool. But really, uh, there's really no real difference, as far as I can tell, with any of these small arms. The only reason you would probably want to unlock them is because of preference or cool factor or whatever sniper rifles uh you need to research the scopes for them these don't like this is a sniper rifle but i've made the mistake by researching them building them and equipping them and spending all that time and resource doing that which is a while 66 days is a long time especially when you can you know you could do police and militia uniforms or your rpgs or whatever uh so you still have to research the sniper rifle Plus the ammunition, so 76251. Where's 76251? So that's down here. So that's down the queue. It's a pretty popular round. I think a lot of the guns and vehicles use this. So, And then you have to research the scope. So depending on what you want. So 66 days for a scope. And then 83 days for, well, that's just a reflex times four. You probably want something a bit stronger. So one of these. So 83 days just for a scope. So you'd have to research those and then put those in a production queue and make sure you have the proper resources for to build that. I don't know. I've never built a scope before. I've never built sniper rifles. With, well, I never built a proper sniper rifle with a scope. And I've never actually um, picked any up from the enemy as well. So I've never actually used a proper sniper rifle in this game. But uh, that's just a personal preference. My point is there's really, I mean, the FAL really will do you for the whole game. There's not much difference unless you get into some of these light machine guns. I think the L86 is a light machine gun. I could be wrong. Um, the S, that's a NATO service weapon. So I don't think it's a sniper rifle or a uh, light machine gun. I'm actually not seeing any light machine guns on the democracy side unless this L86 is, but I can't get a description on it because I don't have it unlocked. So either way, I'm just, that's just kind of a tip on, you know, you don't need to research all of these and try, I mean, if you want to try them out, that's fine. But again, you're going to be spending a lot of time and a lot of resources doing that. But I mean, if you want to try them out, if you want to just spend a game and unlock all of them just to see what they're all about, that's, you know, that's totally fine. Same with the vehicles. Like you just unlock everything, see what you like. And then the next game you play, you know what you're going to unlock and try and make it to, um, that gun, you know, try and uh, focus on getting that gun as quick as possible instead of being like, well, is the M MK18 any good? I don't know. Let's research it and find out. So me, I don't really bother. I just pick up whatever weapons I can get off the ground. So I think that's it for technology. Now we're going to talk about construction. 
So the bottom right screen under construction here, we've kind of mulled over this before. You can see, as you can see on the right side of the screen, you have a list of all of your cities. You can scroll up and down on this depending on how many cities you have. So the cities will tell you. So if I click on uh, Red Tanla, it will give me the supplies that are in the city and I can click over to the garrison. It just gives you the city menu. Also, it'll tell you quickly, even if I have nothing. So Retalia is making gold ore. And you can see that if I click on construction. So Rantala, I don't even know, that city has a gold mine in it. So it's building gold ore. So it represents what's happening in here. Lulungano has bread and wheat. So if we go into construction, look for Luongo, we have bread and wheat. So it tells you what's being built in that city. Also, it tells you like, so <clears throat> we've looked at Allendorf before. It's building um, 762 rounds and a copper mine. So you come in here, Allendorf. You can see the copper mine. <clears throat> you can see the copper mine here, but you can only see the what those 762 rounds if you come into your production queue and see Allendorf here. So Allendorf, the 762 rounds are represented here and the copper ore is represented here as well because each one of these mines, so the gold mine, every one of these mines will be represented. So this queue here, how, how you have the city and like the, the, the squares that go horizontally here, that's kind of the same idea as what's going on in production. So you have Allendorf somewhere. Allendorf here is represented on this whole line. Obviously these are blacked out because Allen, Allendorf has a military factory in it and a copper mine. So it's got, I think each city has at least one, one Q here. Oh no, it only has, it has one queue because of the military factory. So you could build anything but by, you know, anything that's open, that's not grayed out. So you can't build anything down here. The only reason we can build a copper, we can do the copper ore here is because we have the copper mine in Allendorf. So if you're ever looking down here and you're seeing something that's lit up like that, it means that you have a city that's not producing the resource that is available in that city. So Allendorf has a copper mine in it. So we need to click on that. It'll put it in here. And then we have a military factory that lets us build uh, any sort of anything else that's not a building material. So any ammunition, any weapons, vehicles, anything that's uh, lit up here, you can put in that queue. You can put M16s. Oh, it's going to have to explain that later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can, you have the, let's say this, you have the option to put anything that isn't grayed out in this area. I'm going to explain a little bit more on this later and why we're not getting those 762 rounds in Allendorf again. We're going to talk about that later. Um, so these military factories in Podenza represent two building slots here. If Podenza had those two military factories and a copper mine, like, or a gold mine or whatever, you would have an extra slot here represented for that gold mine. So you would come down, scroll down here. This gold ore would be lit up. You would click on it and it would take one of those slots. The two military factories are represented with these two building tiles. So I can use two of them right there. I can put anything in there that I want. That's not grayed out. That's a material that's not one of these building, um, building blocks of the game. So like we talked about before, if you're working on, if you're using higher resource management difficulties, you're going to want to streamline your cities. So you're going to want to put a a um, gold plant here so you don't have to move your gold ore to let's say we put the gold mine in Podenza. you're not going to have to put 
You're not going to have to manually make that convoy by coming in here. You know, let's say our gold ore is in Verma and our gold mine is in Fiskadel. You'd have to come into Verma, look at your gold ore, click on there, go down to what city was it? Fiskadel. Fistal here, make sure you click the right city, um, gold ore, and send as much as you want. Um, I'm not sure how much it would, how much, I don't know how much gold ore it takes to make one gold ingot. It might show us in the menu when we go down. And then you would have to just send that. It'll send that little truck like we had before. I don't know if that truck is still in, on its way to where we sent it. Did we send it to Allendorf? It's probably already made it because we had some time pass, but that little truck that you remember uh, from the beginning of the video, it'll manually send it there. So you have to wait because it doesn't happen right away. So the little truck will send out from the, from Verma. It'll go down the road and make its way to Fiskadel. Once it gets there, you'll have that gold ore there and then you can make the mine. So, but if you're playing on easy, resource management you don't need to worry about that you can put your gold mine in podenza if you want and it'll just take the gold ore from the global resource and use it otherwise you're probably going to want to put your gold mine in here so that the gold mine is the gold is being produced there because retalia where is it So the gold ore is being produced here from the gold mine. So this is uh, Ran Tal. What I can't say this. Whatever. Rant Alla. Rant Alla. So Rant Alla has the gold ore mine. So it's producing. So this is the all the resources that are in this city because we're in the supply tab. We have the garrison tab and the supply tab. So all the supply in this city is going to be represented in here. So gold ore is here because we have the gold ore mine here. So if we put the gold plant here, it's going to have the gold ore here to take it from. And then eventually you're gonna see gold, uh, just gold here. You'll see it uh, represented in the city. It's gonna be in the city wherever the mine is. What's going to be, it, the gold is going to be placed wherever the plant is placed. That's what I wanted to say. Same with the gold, um, the gold ore will be in whatever city it's placed. The only reason I have everything in Verma here is because this is, I play on easy resource management. So I like to bring everything over to one hub city. Like here, we have a lot of stuff here because we just captured this territory um, midway through this playthrough and I haven't moved it over yet, but I'm going to move all this stuff. I'm going to take it all, send it to Verma. Whoops, that's not the city. Send it to Verma. We can move all supplies to selected location. So Verma selected, move all supplies, click that button, send it. Now, Compelios, where we just were, where all those resources were, is empty because it's going to send it in this one truck. Each supply, no matter how many supplies you're sending, each supply convoy will just be one truck. So it's going to, this truck here is representative of all those resources. It's going to drive out of, you know, you can see how, you know, this is speed one. And that's how fast the truck's going. So you can kind of imagine um, how long it's going to take to get to Verma. Once it gets to Verma, it'll unload it and everything's fine. One thing to note, any resources that are in a truck in transport are unusable. So if I took all this supply from Verma and moved it to Hepala, it's going to disappear. Well, whatever resources are in the city are going to disappear from up here until they get to Hepala and are placed in the city. So 
I mean, if you're, and that will affect all of your production. I mean, if you need that supply while it's in transport, you're going to lose, nothing's going to be, be, nothing's going to be being made while it's in transport. So keep that in mind as well. What else to talk about this that we haven't talked about? I mean, again, you can only research, you can only build certain tiles, certain buildings on certain tiles. Like you can't build mines or you can't build plants on farms and you can't build farms on production military factories. One thing that I would recommend if I can find a city that will let me build it. So Podenza is a capital city. And that's why we're able to research these two buildings, the bank and the research center. The research center is, does make a difference. It does. It, I mean, I've had it where I've had maybe five research centers and it makes it so that like nothing is over 20 days for research, even some of the tanks. So it's definitely, and it does stack. The more research centers you have in whatever city, you can have three in Podenza or one, you know, you can separate them. It, it doesn't matter where they are just they do stack so i would recommend building you know at least three or four maybe even five so uh yeah that's definitely recommended yeah so banks i mean they're bringing in ten thousand dollars per year so they cost 25 12 almost thirteen thousand dollars twelve thousand five hundred so they're not even going to pay themselves off until a year after they're made so banks, I find, really aren't that good of a building to make. What I would, I would much rather build a research center over a bank any day. You also have residential buildings, so these will bring in more people to your empire, and you can make those into either workers or um, reservists for your um, armies to use. So that's one thing you can think of. I usually find, I mean... You, you really don't have a manpower problem the more that you um, spread out your borders. So the more uh, territory you conquer, I mean, you really have enough people in your army. Again, some of that, sometimes you'll even get one through the AI. They'll build them here. So personal preference, um, if you want to build them or you want to try them out, I mean, they're not a terrible building, but I mean, there's, I wouldn't recommend spamming them by any means. Construction site, so uh, what does this do? The construction site in, is intended for training and further employment or specialists of the construction building. Gives increased, gives a stable increase in buildings in our republic, thereby accelerating, accelerating construction. So I guess this is going to accelerate the time it takes to build things. I don't know if that is just in the city that it's made or if it's, uh, affects your whole empire. I've never built one before, but to me, I would assume, again, we're assuming here that it's going to affect just the city that it's built in. I could be wrong, but, um, that might be something to test out again. Here you have your coal, your gold, copper, aluminum, and steel plants. All those turn your raw materials into, uh, useful, turns your raw materials into ingots so your all of your ore turn that into usable resources you have your refinery which turns your oil into fuel your distillery which turns from wheat will turn into alcohol which helps with stability military factory so if you want to open up more queues oops in your production, so let's say we wanted another slot here in Podenza, we would come into uh, construction, click on this icon here, or this one, doesn't matter, you don't have to go down the line. Click on this and build a military factory, and then that will open up another slot, oops, again, wrong one, another slot in construction. Podenza, it'll open up this to have an option to build anything in this, anything that's lit up here. So you have a sawmill, which turns your wood into wood boards. Your canning factory turns your meat into 100 canned goods. 
garment factory, which is used to build uniforms, are built from wool. Uh, tobacco is built from tobacco factory will produce cigarettes. Um, you build tobacco from or you build cigarettes from tobacco, which is not in this queue because we're not on a farm tile. And your bakery is produces bread from wheat. And if we come into a a farm city, so Lungano is a farm city. We've already gone through that. It's going to give us dip, different options for to build. So this time we have a wheat field. We can build the tobacco field for, and the cigarette, the tobacco factory. You can build that here, which is nice if you're not playing on easy resource management. Uh, your cotton field for your cloth and your garment factory, your meat and your canned and I guess that's it. Your stone pit. I don't think we could have built a stone pit here. No. Yeah, I don't think you can build a stone pit in your capital cities. But you can build them in your military factory buildings. Which is different. We've, we've gone over this before. So this is our capital city here with a little group of buildings on that little icon there. Um, you have your airfield, which is represented by that little airplane. The farm, which is represented by the barn, your military or your industrial city, which is represented by this little garage here, uh, your port with the anchor, and yeah, that's it. So, and you can build your stone quarries in your industrial cities, but you can't build them in your capital cities. And same goes with research centers. You can build them... In capital cities, as you can see, each territory, each province, I guess you could say, has its own capital city. So Saunders, the capital city here. Podenza is the capital city there. Um, Compelios is the capital city. So you can only build research cities and research um, centers and banks in capital cities where you can only build, you can't build stone quarries. I don't know if you can build stone quarries on a farm. What about a port? No, not on a port. Or that's an airport. So you can't build them on airports. This is a port here. You can build stone quarries on shipyard cities. So these are different as well. So your airbase, you can only build select things there. And your shipyard. If it'll let me click on it. You can only build certain items here. So again, you need to plan out what you want to build and where. And also, we talked about trying to get at least your logging plant, your sawmill, and your stone pit down first before you start building. At least that's my recommendation, is doing that before you start building any sort of copper or copper plants or any sort of refineries. Um, yeah, any sort of plants, like here even a refinery or anything because as you can see it takes 95 wood boards and 85 stone that's a lot early game and also you want to get your what i would recommend building the, again this is a recommendation get a, a bakery up first because you're always going to start off with a wheat field because again we talked about that each province starts off with one wheat field well, at least one wheat field and at least one raw material. Some start off with two wheat fields and some start off with two raw materials. Like this province here, you're starting off. So this province is rather large. As you can see, it comes around up here. So all this is one province. So you're going to start off with a capital city, a port. I think every faction starts off with a port. I could be wrong on that. Most of them, if not all, start off with ports. So, yes, most, if not all, start with ports. Not everyone starts off with airfields. Airfields are... They're placed always with the same factions. They're not randomized. Like, cities are always placed in the same spots. The only thing that's randomized is what's being produced in the city at the beginning of the game. Uh, your farms are always going to be like Grava is always going to be a farm tile and it's always going to produce wheat. Fiskdal 
will always be an industrial center city, but it the the oil will change. I mean, if I started a new game, this might be um, iron ore or copper ore, gold or whatever, whatever raw material, like any one of these ores um, or oil, it that will change. But Grova will always be a wheat field. And it will always have this airport here. So you need to, what was, oh God, what was my point? I don't, I, this game, trying to explain the way this game works is mind numbing. <laughs> it's not even that it's that difficult. It's just, like I said, at the beginning of the video, there's so many different um, mechanics of the game that tie into each other. It, it's either rather, at least for me, I'm like, going brain dead <laughs> trying to explain how that everything works uh so i forgot what my point was so that's good all right let's move on to production now so this is our production screen we've kind of glanced over this uh earlier so we have our the products that are available to produce here and all whatever is available here will be representative of what you have researched so all the all the ammunition I've researched, all the weapons that I've researched, uh, any vehicles that I've researched, and same with Navy and Air Force. Anything that I've researched, like for say, what have we done? The Vulcan 20 millimeter we've researched. So we come into production and the Vulcan 20 millimeter is here. So now if I wanted to, I could click on it and it'll place it into the queue to be built down through here we re we briefly talked about down here these are only going to light up in representative of if it's available to be built so rantala has a gold mine there so it's producing it has the opportunity to produce gold ore so if i unclick it i've we've taken it off the production queue which means that if we if we just recently conquered that so let's say we just recently conquered this city as it is, you know, our territory that we started off with was way up here. So we've, we've conquered a few, we've conquered our way to Rantala. We, we notice that it has gold ore here. So we've conquered it. It's ours. We go into production. We scroll down. This will be lit up now. So we click on it. It's going to put it in Rantala because that's where the mine is. And now it's going to start producing that gold ore. And one, as we look at this, we have the city name, the production efficiency. So right now everything starts off at 20% when you put it on the queue and that will go up with time. And here it tells you how many hours in game it's going to take to build I don't know what it is. I think it's 10 per production. So 10 per round. So when I say round, that is, as you think, like a car coming off the assembly line. So each car is one round. So it's 960 hours for, I think, 10. I think 10 gold ore comes off every round. And that time will shorten as your production efficiency grows and this will grow over time um because yeah it's not this won't ever i think like hearts of iron it goes up each time each round so each time we produce gold ore, our proficiency goes up that's not the way it works here this is just straight time so eventually i don't know if i have a hundred percent ore on the queue 100% ore. Okay, so here in Verma, we have a aluminum ore mine there. So we are able to, if I click this, it's aluminum ore is going to light up right here. Um, I don't want to because you don't, once you have something on the production queue, you if unless absolutely necessary or you just don't want to produce it anymore, you don't want to take it off the production queue because you're going to lose all that efficiency. So if I took this aluminum ore off the queue, it's going to light up here because it means that I have the option to put it back on because we're not using the mine in Verma. 
if I put it back on, it's going to go back to 20 and this is going to go back up to whatever that was, 960. So I think all ore is the same. I could be wrong. So at 100% efficiency, every 120 hours, and 100 is the max, I, I don't know a way to make this any, you can't go up to 110 any or anything higher that I know. So every Verma has an aluminum mine that's working at 100% efficiency because it's been here for a while. And every 120 hours, it's producing, I wish it would tell me, I think it's 10 ore. So the amount of ore doesn't change, just the time it takes to produce that ore. So 120 hours at 100% efficiency is producing 10 aluminum ore. That, my aluminum, um, <clears throat> that my aluminum plant in Boa Vista, as you can see, we have aluminum, the aluminum ingot here. I have a aluminum plant in Boa Vista. So now I am able to make aluminum out of my aluminum ore. And playing on easy resource management, I can have that mine in Verma without making supply trucks to make this aluminum here in this city. I do have aluminum in Boa Vista, aluminum ore in Boa Vista, because even though I play on easy resource management, I just like things to look clean. So when I'm going through my construction, I, I can see like, you know, that my my mines are where they should be, but they really don't have to on easy resource management. I just do for my own personal OCD. Otherwise, I would have to move this aluminum ore from Verma to Boa Vista for it to work. If I, well, I guess if I didn't have this aluminum mine here. So as you can see, we put this copper on at Allendorf at 20% because that's the minimum it'll be. And it's going to take 816 hours to produce 10. So you, like I said, you don't want to take stuff off the queue um, unless absolutely necessary. You can't, and there isn't a way that you can pause anything. Like a, let's say you're running low on iron and you're like, well, I'm running low on iron. I got all this ammunition being built. I don't have enough to produce everything, but I don't want to lose my efficiency. There's really no way other than taking it off the queue to save that I know of that saves the production efficiency. So you, the only real option that I know of is to take off. Let's say like we needed this, we needed these 25 millimeter rounds and we're like, well, we're, we're good on seven, six, two rounds right now. And I'm really starting to run low on iron. Cause as you can see, it takes two iron to make uh, a thousand rounds. Cause every, every round of, production is a thousand. So we're going to get a thousand seven, six, two rounds. Same with all ammunition. I'm pretty sure it's always a thousand rounds. So when this in 29 hours, as you can see down here, we're going to get a thousand 25 millimeter rounds in Obergorf, <laughs> whatever city that is. And same with the seven, six, two in 72 hours at hundred percent efficiency, we're going to get a thousand seven, six, two rounds, but there's no way to like pause the 762 round. The only way to, like I said, if you're like, well, I need to save my resources for the 25 millimeter, because as you can see, it takes three iron and one copper every time it's produced. Um, so every 29 hours, well, so every 72 hours, we're going to need two iron in this, well, for easy resource management, we're going to need, it's going to consume two iron to make that, to make those thousand rounds every 72, 72 hours at 100% efficiency. Here, this is 29 hours at 83% 83, uh, 83 efficiency. I'm assuming that's going to go down to maybe 25 hours at 100%. I don't know the exact math. So the only way to really save your, um, if you have to take something off, you can't pause it. If, you, if you're trying to save resources, if you don't have enough and you, you need to take something off, you can't pause it. You have to take it off the queue. And then when you do have those resources back, you can put them back on the queue. But you're going to start off at 20% efficiency. And I mean, it, 
it'll it'll grow as time goes on but unfortunately there's no way to like pause it another thing to note with this screen is the only way to let's say i wanted to make 45 acp because you can make excuse me so on easy resource management because you you take the resources from the global pool if i wanted to produce 45 acp rounds in labano it it's kind of difficult i can't drag this over or um like i can't i can't click here and i click here the only way that you can produce 45 acp in labano is if you scroll up, well, you don't have to scroll up, but you would click on the 45 ACP, fill in all the cues. I can't even build them in there. Okay, never mind. Let's say I wanted to build them in Allendorf. So I've I've clicked on 45 ACP. I've filled in these lines. This might be a um, port city or something. That's I think you need a military factory in the city to be able to build ammunition. So Lebano might be a port city. It might be an, an airfield. I don't know. We can we can check. Oh, here it is. So it is, it is an airfield. So yeah, you're not going to be able to build because uh, if you look over here, so Labanio it doesn't have a military factory. The only thing that has open are these two. So that's one thing to keep in mind as well. So that's why we can't build the 45 ACP in in here because it doesn't have a military factory in the city. But we can build it in Allendorf. So as you can see, we've clicked, we filled up the queue until we've gotten to Allendorf. So now they're there. So then you would have to go back and delete all your previous queues. And that's really the only way that you can place certain resources into cities where you want them built, which is kind of really cumbersome, kind of really. It's cumbersome, and that's just what it is. Uh, same with anything else. If you want Colt, oh, let me see what city I could even build them in. I don't Compelios. If I want Colts made in Compelios, I have to click on it and fill up all the available queues that you can build pistols in. So one, two, three, four, five. I think we built an extra one somewhere. Oh, it doesn't look like it. So now that we have the pistols building in Compelios where we wanted them, we have to go back and delete all the other queues. And then, okay, now we have them built there. A thing to note too is, so a Colt 911 takes one iron to build, but again, that iron is taken when the gun is built. So it's not like I'm wasting one iron putting it in a production queue and... You know, you're like, oh my god, I had to play six six pistols just to get it to the city where I want them built. No, no, you don't have to worry about that. The iron is consumed when the pistol is built. So when it won't be 120 hours, because by the time the pistol's built, it'll probably be around 100, 100 hours, because your efficiency is going to go up with time. So in 120, around 120 hours, one iron's going to be consumed and the pistol will be built. And that's the same with everything in here. So again, that is kind of why you can't spam out, I mean, unless you have the resources, and why I'm why I went back on kind of why you're probably not able to build everything you want and why you might want to skip a year um with your vehicles because vehicles are boss. I'm going to stand on that and I'm going to go to my grave saying that vehicles are king in this game. Yes, infantry with RPGs can be deadly, but if you play the game and you play vehicles to their strengths, you don't need to worry about infantries with RPGs. I can wipe out, I could have one tank and wipe out a full enemy battalion full of infantry. I could probably wipe out a full enemy battalion full of infantry with one or two MRAPs. They would just light them up. The distance that they fire, you would be able to, to mop them up. I've had comments uh, in previous videos saying, you know, why don't you use infantry? Um, you're, you're spamming vehicles. And I'm like, because it works. And you can see that through all my series. I focus mainly on vehicles. I do fill my vehicles up with infantry if I can. If not, I'll go in without them. As you can see, 
we're going off on a bit of a tangent here, but that's okay. So as you can see, a lot of my units aren't aren't filled up with um, with infantry. I have five out of ten, one out of ten for my tanks because I don't like them wasting inf wasting. Um, the AI doesn't know how to use tanks properly. It, it wastes um, ammunition very very quickly. But that's a whole other topic. So I do like to have infantry with my vehicles if if possible. But vehicles are king. So for me, when I'm talking about researching vehicles and skipping years, that's kind of what I was talking about with production. That listen, so the Bradley takes 35 iron, 15 aluminum, 5 copper. Even late in this game, 35 iron, what's the math on that? 35, you can build about... You can't even, you can build two, four, you can build maybe five, if my math is correct on that, probably not, but um, so four with 235, so that's what I was talking about with maybe <clears throat> skipping years and not trying to build everything because you don't have the option to spam out these vehicles, like, like for me, at this point in the game, I only have one do I have one or two? I have two. Okay. So I have two rounds of Bradleys coming out at, you know, 3,200 hours. So they're coming out very slowly. So that's giving me time to maybe build up some, some iron. But you also got to remember we're building ammunition for everything as well. So the ammunition, so this 25 millimeter is for the Bradley. So that's also costing three iron um you know and we have three runs of that plus the vulcan ammo which at this point in the game the vulcan was um a little bit obsolete but that's costing two iron what else yeah that's another 35 iron so you also have an ammunition you need to make sure that you're building you're gonna you want to put on more ammunition than you think you're going to need because you're going to be burning through it with vehicles, the AI loves to, like, <laughs> once the, the the vehicle will shoot at an, at an enemy, once the enemy's dead, it's still going to fire about 20 or 25 shots at the dead body. It, it doesn't know when to stop properly. So if you're going to let the AI use um, the vehicles and let them kill the enemy, which is effective, I mean, that's mainly what I do as well, you're going to be going through a lot of ammunition. So you have to, remember, this is three iron every 29 hours and it's not even at full potent not full um i infinite um production efficiency so it's going to be even shorter than that so every 20 25 hours let's say at 100 percent efficiency i'm going to be using three iron so that's why you can't like spam out vehicles to where like oh i'm going to research you know every one and i'll have time because really if I went to Leopards, because I think the Leopard is the year after the Bradleys come out, I'm only going to have one or two Bradleys out on the field before the Leopard 1 is available. By the time I research it, research the ammunition, get it in the production queue for 3,200 hours, and then, you know, only have two queues of that. So you're going to have, because this one is almost finished, it's about halfway done at 55% efficiency, so that really makes a difference. You're only going to make maybe three or four of them before, you know, the Leopard 1s come out of technology. So that that's my kind of my explanation for why you may want to skip a year and maybe kind of plan out um, vehicles to maximize your production, if that makes sense. Um, other than that, I don't really know if there's anything else. I mean, also weapons. If you need, if I've researched M16s, if you want to make those, that's going to be three iron. You know, I don't know how much M16s are. 600 hours at 20%. So you probably want to put a few Qs on. But um, that's going to suck back more iron. And that's, again, I'm beating a dead horse here. That's why it's not like, well, I'll research, I'll research Bradley's. And I'll put, you know, I'll put like five, I'll, I'll suit up the whole queue so that I'm going to get, 
you know, in 3,300 hours, I'm going to get six of them or something like that. Maybe if you have enough resources for it, but even at this stage in the game with me, you know, knowing how to play, being reasonably um, conservative with my iron, I'm still only going to be able to get out, what did we say, four Bradleys? So, I mean, that's that's my take on it. Or I can skip the tank year and get eight or nine Bradleys out and then go to this year. But I wouldn't go to this year because I, I don't really like any of these vehicles. So I'm going to skip another another year and get 12 or 15 Bradleys. Well, maybe even more because the production is going to be your production efficiency is going to be higher. So you're going to be bringing out more as long as your resource output can match what you're using to build these. Um, or I, I would probably just go down to the M1A ones and then use these tanks, skip these two years and go down to the Abram X's. So that's, that's about it. You can only build for down here, whatever's grayed out. You can only build what's available in your construction tab. So we have stone quarry in Burhafenim, whatever city that is, there's a stone pit there. So that is going to give us the option to build stone. So I wouldn't do this in a normal situation, but let's say we have that city. Let's say we went here, we built this stone pit, which we did. So we went in here, we clicked on this, we waited for everything to go by. It's gonna tell you um, what it's going to cost. So $2,700, $2,750 and 45 boards. So we'll click on it. We'll wait the 35 days for it to be built. We're going to cancel that construction for now. Then when it's built, this will light up. So it shows you that it's available. You click on it and it's going to put it in the appropriate slot for where that stone pit was, was built. And then now, as you can see, everything's grayed out because every, all of our production I think you guys get it, that all of our production buildings are being used. They're not, if I don't have the stone in here, even though we have the stone pit, it's not producing the stone. You have to actually click it and put it in this queue for it to be built. And again, 1200 hours, we're going to get, what was it, five stone or something? But again, it's at 20% efficiency, so that's going to go up. Um, you can... You can fill up your queue, but eventually you'll run out. Like if I just load up 45 ACPs, eventually, you know, you're going to run out of military factories to build. Um, you can only build landing craft in ports. So the landing craft I just put on, it's only going to put it in a port city. And it'll put it at the, the most top one in the queue. If I want to build... The same as anything else, if I want to build one here, I think this is a port, I have to click on it again so that it's in there, go back up and delete that one. Unless you want to, that's fine too, if you have the resources for it. But, uh, so now, if we wanted the, the landing craft to be built here, that's where it's going to be built. But you can only build those in ports. Um, airplanes are the same. We're not building airplanes at the moment. But you can only, if I did have, I don't even know if I have any air things unlocked. I don't. The only air units I have on this campaign are the three helicopters that we start off with. So this was my starting province. And you always start off with a small air force. Same, same with uh, your navy. You start off with a small navy. Well, small. You start off with three or four landing craft. Um, and that same goes with the landing craft. You can only if I did have any airplanes researched, it would show up in this queue here and I could only build them in airports. And then when they're built, they will show up in the inventory. So if I click on, let's say we were building these helicopters, we went into our research, we, we researched, um, let's just say we researched F-15s. So we click on it, we wait the 100 days, boom, it's ready to go. You don't need, like I said before, you, these things don't require ammunition. Like you don't have to worry about anything in here. So you research them, 100 days, they're done. Come into your production, they'll be in here somewhere. 
usually around your vehicles will usually be at the top. So you would click on it. It would go to whatever airport that you wanted in. I think Porta Maria. No, that sounds like a port. Let's say we want, let's say we were building the, the airplanes in La Banio. Um, the airplanes would be in once they're once they're ready once they've been built if we put them in Labanio's queue so we would have to put the airports or the airplanes in this slot because that's Labanio they'll when they're built they'll be in the supply here and what you have to do is click on them so that you'll see or no you'll see a little um sorry i said that wrong you're going to see a icon down here that says create um, air force or something it's something the same same along the lines as verma like if i go to my forces there'll be a little button down in this corner where this rearmament is it'll be it'll look different but it'll be there and then you click on that and every time you click on it let's say you had three um three jets here every time you click on it it'll place a jet on the map and you can see the little uh, NATO icon there for Air Force, it'll say, it'll tell you the amount. And that goes with the same with the landing craft. When you build the landing craft, it'll be in the supply. So right now this this um, port has money, stone, and wood boards in it. I don't know why the wood boards are there, but this is our stone quarry. There's a stone quarry here, but anyways. So then you would see the... Uh, whatever you built the whatever navy you built in there and you'll have a little icon here that'll say create navy or create something i forget what it says and it'll show up in that's when it'll pop up into the ocean and then you know you could you have your little navy here we have three landing ships right here and that's the fleet one thing i wanted to say before we move on i think i touched on this before the right side of your screen here it shows you what you're making in each city. So Razvet is making um, fuel and oil. So that instead of going into here, yeah, instead of going into here, Razvet. So Razvet is making. So right here, you can see Razvet, the city, the city name, oil and fuel. It should have. Oh, I have, might have to let time pass on. That's why the Bradleys aren't on there yet. There we go. So the Bradleys came on because we just put these on as an example, which we can take those off. Well, it doesn't matter anyways. So anything you have in production here, um, as you scroll down, is going to show up on the right side of the map here for each city that it represents. So Resvet, we had the fuel, the oil, and the Bradley. The Bradley will disappear because we just took it off. So that's a quick way to see what city is building what. It doesn't tell you like it tells you in here that you know this ammunition is costing three iron and one copper it doesn't really show you that it just shows you what it is it also doesn't show you how much iron's being produced it just gives you a quick summary on what's going on also if you want to look at these to click on it once to see the city let's go to verma because verma actually has stuff in it so verma down here so we can see Verma, the supply of everything that's in the city. So that's a quick way, like Saunders producing ammunition. So we can see that Saunders has um, produced some ammunition. Uh, what I like to do, which you don't have to do, but what I like to do is keep everything together. So this is just personal preference. I'll take this. I'll just click on it. I'll, you know, Verma's already picked, but we'll go into our screen. Pick Verma. Um, move all supplies to selected location, send it. So now everything from Sonder, as you can see, Sonder is empty now. It doesn't have anything in it and it's all in this truck. So this truck's going to drive its way to Verma and the resources will be there once it gets there. Uh, I don't have to do that because I'll use easy resource management, uh, difficulty, but if you were using um, higher difficulty, no, wait, right, yeah, I'm, I'm mulling through what's going on. Higher difficulties, you need to have the ammunition where you're trying to rearm your troops. But for me, 
I can rearm in any city no matter what. The only reason I do what I do is because I like to just keep everything together. Also, deny the enemy. I mean, we're kind of going off topic here, but... I mean, even if, let's say, Compelios, we just captured Compelios. Uh, this was the capital city of this province, so every capital city is going to be holding all of their building resources and most of their equipment. Um, you'll find other stuff in their military factories as well, but most of, I mean, all the most of their food, their raw material, their uh, refined material, uh, most, be eighty percent of the faction supply will be in their capital. So what I'll do is I'll click on it. We've already done it, but I'll move everything over to a hub city. So now, even if I left this city, the enemy's going to conquer a city, a dead city, pretty much. Uh, unless, the only time it would really matter is if, like, Rasvet, if we lost Ravet, Rasvet, we would lose the oil production. Not a big deal, because it's not our only oil city. So that's kind of my strategy for you know, if, if the enemy comes after me with a stronger force, I can always kind of retreat and find a better location. They can take this city. It's not a big deal because there's nothing there. We've taken everything out of that city into our pile. And you can do that with, uh, even if you're not playing on easy resource management difficulty, even if you're playing on expert. If you see a enemy coming after an uh, unguarded city, or if you if you think you're going to lose that that city even if there's troops there just click on it and move everything to another city and the enemy's capturing pretty much essentially what is a dead city um, especially in Compelios yes you're going to lose that production but really again we're not even taking advantage of a lot of our production like we still have plenty of slots to be building plenty of things the thing that's holding us back is our resources. I mean, I would love to be making more Bradleys or more flotilla ships or more ammunition or even what else do we have here? Like more M16s to streamline the army or med kits. But you have to remember, you don't want to build past your resource income. So yeah, we do have open slots for, you know, a lot of more ammunition. But like I said, all that stuff costs uh, supply. So that's kind of, even if you're like, well, the city has, you know, military factories that I could be building stuff in. It's like, well, are you already using all of your military factories already? Maybe in the early game, but as you like conquer more territory, I've never been at a state where I've been using all of my military factories to build stuff. Uh, one, because I don't really need to, because I usually already have the equipment and on the field and two because your resources can't keep up with your demand so if that makes sense so even if you're playing on just just take all of just move it all it's it's easy just move it even to the next city or whatever city you need for me for easy resource management verma is holding everything so uh that's where it's going and I, that's the way i know where everything is you just have to click on some of these if you want to um, just play with OCD. And so I would want to move this ammunition to here. Not that I need to, I just want to. But for the conquered cities, yes, move all of the resources out of there so that if you do lose the city, doesn't matter. It's, it's uh, a dead city. So I think that is officially the production tab. There's not much more to talk about that that I can think of anyways. Moving on to Squad Editor. This is something that I don't really dabble into too much. There is a lot you can do in here if it works. I've always found that I, I don't know if I'm not using it right or if um, it's not working properly. The game is in early access, so I don't know. Uh, this is something you can experiment with yourself. There's a lot to do. I mean, you can, you can make a lot of, you can individualize every single different person in your squad uh, you can do their head like any sort of customization with chest their pants their t-shirt glasses everything you can see here you can do the weapon that they use uh, any attachments for the weapons you know you can have two attachments here a silencer compensator 
uh, rocket launcher, just RPG. They're, that's the only rocket launcher in the game as of now is an RPG. Um, one thing to note, even if you give someone a UMP, they st- you still need the UMP to give them. It's not like you make a... Sc- you make a squad and you equip them with UMPs. I mean, if you don't have UMPs to give them, it's just going to give them a random weapon that you have. Yeah, I'm going to move over, move my head over a little bit. It's just going to give them a random weapon in your inventory. So that's one thing to think of as well. You can kit them out, but you better have the, like, I can give this guy a type 74, type 76 mod with, you know, a handle and a dock site, but if I don't have it, he's not going to, I can't give it to him. It's just, I think that it's just going to default to that if we have that equipment. Also, if you come over here, this is kind of what's maybe, I don't know if this is what I'm confusing, but you can pick a police, your militia units, your regular units, spec op units, and elite. And what determines who they are is the uniforms that they're wearing. So if we come into research, if we go to ammunition, you have your police uniforms, militia, regular, and spec ops. One thing that's missing here is guerrilla units, or guerrilla uniforms, and it also tells you in here. So we have guerrilla. I don't know why these guys are guerrilla. They're using um, militia. So I'm not sure what that's all about but you can see what units you're using so we have a lot of guerrilla and militia units my understanding was that the guerrilla units were only your units were based on what um uniform they were wearing because i can if you come down here you can create a standard squad a police squad or a militia so i these are kind of i mean that's that's a uh transport truck NATO icon, if I'm correct. So if I click on that, it's going to give me a militia. It's going to give me a motorized militia unit. If I click on standard squad, it's going to give me the same thing. The MP is when it's going to give them a police uniform, if available. Again, you can only build what's in your city. So we have police uniforms here and militia. Um, We're kind of backtracking here on on resources on even with easy resource management your weapon um, attachments uniforms manpower and your weapons are not shared in the global pool so if i wanted to make if i want to create a squad in compelios i can't because we just moved all of the resources over and there's no there's no men or equipment to build them so I would have to go somewhere where they have them both. Even if they have, so you need both. You Even if it has manpower, <clears throat> even if, so if it had reservists here, so we have three reservists, which means we could make three units. And I'm talking, we're going way off course here. It really doesn't have anything to do with squad editor. We're going to talk about that later. Sorry. Sorry we're getting off topic. So anyways, yeah, so you can go to your militia, uh, you can change what type they are, so armored, infantry, and then you can also come into here and individually change your infantry. So you can say, I want my lieutenant to have, you know, a, a assault rifle, I want my sergeant to have a light machine gun, you can come down here, find one, uh, I want my corporal to have um, whatever, you can kit out each one of your squads, because each squad has 10 units in it. So if we escape out of here. So each squad, even though this is a um, a vehicle, the vehicle has 10 members in it. If this was just a regular infantry squad, like these, like this guy here. So we have a NATO infantry symbol. This police, well, this is a police squad, but same, same idea. Just pretend this is a militia squad. It's going to create 10 individual soldiers for this unit. So you can kit out each one of these soldiers differently. I think, I don't know how it represents if the top one is the sergeant. Uh, like if it goes sergeant, corporal, 
uh, and then down to privates. I don't know how that works because I've never really worried about squad editor that much. But uh, that's how it works. So 10 units per squad. So you come into your squad editor. You have all of your units so you can individually kit them out. You can... You can do just your lieutenant and then copy that to entire squad. If you want all of them to have the same equipment, you can save your preset and you can also save the squad. Or you can go in and do everything individually. But again, it will only give the unit what you set up, what you set up here if you have the equipment available. <clears throat> and also, excuse me, if you pick the right unit. So if you set up your militia, you go, you know, you spend 15, 20 minutes going through here, kidding them all up. It's only going to do that for the militia units. So you have to go, that's where like the save preset is or save squad or something. And then, because I don't see a load option here. So either way, you would have to do that for each one of these just to make sure. Like if you want, you know, your police squad, you don't want to kit them out because you're not really going to be using them on the battlefield. They're more of a garrison unit. So, um, so yeah, just make sure that you're, you're customizing the right unit because also you can go to regular and then you still have, you know, all these options too. You have infantry, motorized, armored, and recon. And then still you have, if you do want to go motorized, regular motorized infantry, you still have to pick the vehicle. So if you don't have the vehicle, it's not going to give it to them. And there is a lot. So for me... I find it kind of cumbersome. Uh, I don't really mess around with this too much. Mainly what you, what I would do if I wanted to, if I, you know, was really interested, I would just kind of maybe customize the unit's look, and that's about it. Because, like, my guys are kitted out. It's just going to kit them out with random weapons, whatever's available at the time in the city, because... Weapons are not in the global shared pool. So in Verma, Verma is kind of different because we have all of the equipment here. Like we have plenty of options for our units. I don't know how it decides what infantry unit gets what. But I mean, as you can see, it's kidding them out with FALs. Looks like we had a lot of FALs. As we go down, what did this unit get? An FAL. Uh, this police unit got a rifle so it i don't know what determines well probably gave him the rifle because the police unit has a rifle yeah as you can see it's using uh concarno which i think is what it actually gave it yeah so i guess the squad editor works a bit you just need to make sure you have the equipment as you set them up in the squad editor otherwise it'll just give them random stuff which, I mean, that's why I don't really mess around with it, because I I don't really care what they use. I do have M16s unlocked here. So if I built a bunch of these and I put them in Verma, it's probably going to default them with the M16, because the M16 is the best weapon that um, we have. So it would probably give them all M16, so I don't even have to go into the squad editor and worry about it, because it's going to be there anyways. And that's about it for a squad editor. All right, so we've I've loaded up a new game as Sambro here because I wanted to demonstrate diplomacy. This is going to be the next thing we talk about. I don't know what's here. It's not available. It must be coming in a later patch. But diplomacy is what we're going to be talking about next. And with the last uh, example that we were using, that's our total war campaign. And I have we're at war with everyone, so we can't really do diplomacy with anyone. Well, we could if we made an armistice, but that's that's just going to take too long. It's not really worth it. So we start off a new game. Uh, as you can see here, you have um, options. These symbols will tell you what they represent. So with Malaga, we have the trade agreement, non-aggression pack, military access, and an alliance. And you can make that option in the beginning of the game if you want alliances or not. Um, you can see the relationship status. Or, I guess, excuse me, you can see um, how much they like you. So, relations. So, uh, a lot of people don't like us. 
somehow. It'll go to plus 100, and it'll go to negative 100. And we have trade agreements here. If you wanted to do any sort of diplomacy, you just click on the faction, and it'll give you the available options. So I can't do a non-aggression pack, probably because they don't like me. So I would have to go into improve relations. It'll give you a bit of a tool tip here. Hold on. It'll give you a tool tip here uh, saying, so it's 42% chance of success and the mission time is going to take 30 days. We could also justify a war goal, which is going to take 67% chance and 50%, uh, 50 days to complete. So diplomacy does take a bit of time. I mean, 50 days in the game, that's a reasonable amount of time. You can do a lot uh, in 50 days. So what you do is just click on it it'll give you kind of a detailed information on what's happening it'll tell you your all your treaties and everything you have with the faction itself it'll say 30 days uh success success chance of 42 percent um it'll also say you can allocate 250 dollars in bribes to increase the chance of signing the contract i don't think it tells you the how high the success chance is going to be but if you say click uh, send a bribe, it's going to send $250. So we'll click on that. So now it went to 67%. And that mission is going to be on the way. So we can just close it and forget about it. We're going to cancel this mission because I want to talk about something else. You want to be careful not to cancel stuff because then it means you just wasted that bribe money. You don't get that back. Once you send that bribe, the money's gone. And sometimes the bribes can get up into the thousands. So you, you want to make sure that uh, your, your diplomacy you're doing is what you want to do. Another thing to keep in note is you only have one diplomat. So you can only do one mission at a time. Uh, so if we wanted to send improve relations and send that bribe, okay, that's it. I can't do anything else with any one of these, these factions. So back to the global map, we'll do our thing. Yeah, there's nothing else we can do. We have to wait the 30 days until it's over. Uh, and then it, we can do something else. So keep that in mind as well. You only have one military advisor, or one diplomat. Uh, we also have rebels who are at war with, but that's fine. Uh, let's see if we can... So these guys are our friends, so it'll give us the most options. So you do have a lot of options. You can declare war, armistice, so you can try and make peace with someone you're at uh, war with, justify war goals, so a Cassus Belly, military access, revoke military access, improve relations. A lot of these are self-explanatory. Um, denounce trade agreement, alliance, and denounce alliance. All pretty explanatory stuff. Um, I'm going to go over trade. So trade and diplomacy, I think, are going to be talked about in this section because both, both of them are very closely tied into each other so as you can see we have trade agreements with a lot of these factions um, each faction you have a trade agreement with opens up more excuse me opens up more opportunities for trade here so if I only had if I was only if I only had a trade agreement with uh, Megala here these we would only have, oh God, hold on, sorry. What's their, so their flag is that. So we would only have this bread, these three options here, because that's who's sending it to us, or that's who's giving us the options. This one, so as you can see, we would only have the trade the trade options with the faction that uh, that we would have the trade agreement with. Luckily, we have a lot of trade partners so it's giving us a lot of options here which is nice and like i said before the more factions you're at uh the more factions you have a trade agreement with the more options are going to be in here and it's randomized you uh, there you can't pick what they're going to offer you to, tr to trade um you can also sell your stuff here if you click on how do i do this i've actually never sold anything so I guess this is open for the AI to take, and maybe they will. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess that's how it is, because I'm clicking on it, nothing's happening. 
and how you um, choose something. So you look at what faction it's from. It doesn't really matter. It's cotton, so you're going to get 79 for $790. So all you do, you know, we can look at our cotton. So we have 244. It's probably in Faro, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, as you can see, we said before, you can see where your resources are if you hover to over top of them. So Faro has 244, which is right here. So if we go into uh, trading and we click on that, it's going to give us those and it's going to drop them where? Where did it drop it? I guess it's... I guess it takes time. Maybe it comes in a convoy. I've never paid attention enough to... Because it's, it's in our inventory right now, but it's not showing up in the city. There, okay. Maybe we just had to back out of the city or not and refresh this menu. So now we have the resource. So yeah, all you do is just click on it and I guess it just goes straight into your inventory. Um, that's pretty much it for trade. I don't know if you get better deals with the higher relations. That would make sense, but I don't I don't know. I've never paid close enough attention to it. Um, so now what we're going to talk about is, is sort of my my um, explanation for why I play the way I play. And I'm gonna go over that because it, it has a lot to do with diplomacy and trade. So there's two ways to play the game. There's the diplomacy side. Well, there's more than two ways, but there's, there's two major ways that you can play the game. You can play the diplomatic side or you can play the Blitzkrieg side, which I mainly play because I find that more enjoyable. And the reason for that, the reason for why there's only two options is because if we look at our tile here, we have iron ore and we have wheat. Again, these are randomized. Every time you load up the game, there'll be something different in Boa Vista. Samello and Castello will always be farm cities and they'll always produce wheat. But Boa Vista is the one that's going to be different. There'll, there might be oil here or there might be something else. Anyways. Um... So right now we have iron ore, and as you know, there is plenty of other resources up here to that you need to build. So we look back at our Bradleys, it cost, so I'm just using Bradleys as an example because it's um, it's a decent vehicle to use. Uh, Humvees, I think, are 10 iron and some copper, I don't know, but uh, so Bradleys are 35 iron, uh, 5 copper, and some aluminum. So we don't have access to, to, let's say this was oil, which would make this game even harder. So we have no income of any sort of ore, which means we would have to rely on our trade. So we would come in here, we would find uh, any sort of ingots. If there weren't ingots here, we could we could um, maybe buy the ore and build, go into our construction, maybe build a uh, aluminum. Like, so we, like, like I said, we don't have aluminum. So we're going to have to rely on trade unless we want to go to war. But I'm talking about the diplomatic side. So we come into here. We try and look for aluminum ore. There is none. So we're kind of screwed. Uh, there's no aluminum ingots either. So... There's no way to get the supplies that you're missing unless you go through trade, right? So, unless you want to conquer lands. So, we have iron ore here. What do these guys have? Can we see? No, these guys don't have anything, really. I don't think we can see what's happening over here. Uh, this faction, they're going to have something... Uh, this will be a uh, industry building here. So they're going to have some sort of resource. So let's say that they have uh, aluminum. So we have iron. They have aluminum. Or, yeah, aluminum. Where it's like, well, I can't get aluminum through 
now we have gold here. I don't know if that was always there. I think it was because we haven't unpaused the game. Anyways, they have aluminum ore. They, we don't have aluminum ore in trade. So why don't we conquer them to gain access to that ore? And then we'll build a refining station and we'll be able to make aluminum. The problem with that is once you go to war with somebody, your diplomatic relations with other factions, even your allies, will go down which means it's going to lock out trade because they're not going to like you, which which forces you back into a corner to where you have to go to war with more factions because you don't have trade agreements because you don't... Every time you lose a trade partner, you're going to lose options in here. Like, can you imagine if we lost trade agreement with our ally? That's like 12 options, 12, 13 options that he's giving us and they're all randomized and this will change over time i don't know how long it refreshes like you have to keep coming in here and checking but it will refresh like new things will come up here eventually we'll get aluminum ore and uh, copper ore and things like that but there's no guarantee on when it's coming so you're kind of forced into a corner to expand because you don't have the resources but every time you expand your relations with other factions goes down even if so the proper way the least impactful way to affect your relations through war is to justify a war goal cast a belly send a bribe so we're at 56 percent we'll send that bribe so we've just sent 1500 dollars to bribe make the success chance 100 percent and it's going to be 50 days so we'll exit out of that um in 50 days the uh, war goal will be active so we'll cancel that mission so we'll cancel that but let's say we waited the 50 days then you go into declare war I don't know if I can declare war on anybody surprising I guess it's you. that's changed because you can declare war without a war goal I've done it before um so anyways, so you justified war goal, uh, you declare war, which takes time. It's always 100%, but it takes like eight days. You declare war on this faction. Okay, fine. We come in here. We're already sketchy with like most of our trade partners. So they're going to hate us more. They might cancel relations, uh, cancel our trade agreements because they don't like us enough. So then we're going to lose more options in our trade here, which is is going to give us even less of a chance to give us the resources we need. So we could say, okay, well, we sacrificed three trading partners to get that aluminum ore that's in this city. We're still missing copper and we're still missing oil. Like you need a certain, you need those building blocks. So what you need for a successful army is copper, aluminum, iron, and oil. You need all four of those to be able to build a respectable army. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck with trash. It, that's just the way it is. So we have, so let's say we conquered this land. We sacrificed two trading partners because the war ruined relations with everybody else to where they uh, renounced their trade agreement. But it's like, okay, now we have the iron ore. We're still missing copper and we're still missing oil. Because all we're making in our own territory is iron. So, again, you could wait around, um, not declaring war on any... Do we have aluminum? Did I say that? We have iron. Somehow we're trading aluminum ore. I guess it's just because we have some. I don't know why you would want to give that away. I mean, if I were, I would be taking this off right now. I don't want anyone taking my aluminum. So you can take that off and it takes away the option. So, anyways, you're you're waiting around even longer because you have less options for the resources that you need to build a responsible army. One way to negate that is, so you declared war, you got your aluminum ore, you lost two trade partners, so you can go back in here and improve relations, um, which is 30 days to do one, and at 46%, you're going to want to send a bribe. So you're sending more money. And early game, 25000 is not a lot of money. Especially when you're talking about, you know, um, we have iron mine. We're going to make a steel plant. We're going to spend 90, 
$9,700 on just a plant. And that doesn't include our quarry, our wood, our sawmill, our lumber, our bakery. So the 25000 is not a lot of money. So you're going to be sending a 46% chance. You can send that bribe of $250 for a 73% chance. If that goes through and it doesn't fail, uh, it's not, you're, I don't know what the number is. I mean, we can let time pass and see. So he's at six plus six. Let's turn the game on. Hopefully it passes. Um, and then you're going to slowly build up relations again. You're probably going to spend maybe eight months to a year improving relations enough for the one faction, because you only have one diplomat, for the one faction to get that trade agreement back. But then you're still missing those two other resources. You're missing copper and fuel. And that's the bare minimum, that like resources that you need. So then you would have to, again, keep looking in your trade and hoping that your trade your trade partners are putting in the resources that you want um or and then so once you gain those trade partners back you're like well i'm sick of just staring at this map here you know i have two two territories that i'm looking at um the enemy's getting stronger because they're willing to conquer they don't really care about diplomacy if you give them time um i think this is a rebel event no. Yes. So yeah, these are this is one of those random events we talked about earlier. It it doesn't really affect the outcome of the event. It just affects what resource it's going to take. Like you can't appease the rebels and they'll go away by giving them, you know, money or anything. It's just you want logistics. It doesn't change anything that uh, with the game. So we have rebels now, which is a shame. Also, you always start out with Rebels. So these Rebels were here when we started. Uh, every faction starts off with Rebels. 14 more days for this to go off. Um, so that I'm, I'm trying to explain why... Why it's difficult to play on a diplomacy side. Because you're hemmed in by resources. You're going to be looking at these two screens a lot. So what are we at? nine more days and you're going to be relying on your your allies giving you random because it's all random giving you the materials that you need and it's not even a lot like i don't know if we we don't so there's nothing here i don't even have the option for ore it's almost like we've lost trade partners like that's a i don't know what's going on Yeah, so we can even take the stone as an example if you really needed stone because it, it's going to be around the same, I think. We can wait and see, though. I don't want to give you guys bad information if I can help it. Um, four more days for this. These guys won't attack. Well, they might, but they, they'd be silly if they did. So two more days. So they are attacking unless they're going to... So we were successful with that. So diplomacy, they were at what, six before? So that went up a decent amount. But let's say they were at like minus 70, which is going to be like, if you declare war once or twice on the enemy, um, it's really going to affect the uh, happiness that they have for you. So just think that's one faction for 30 days. We gained, I think we were at six. I mean... Whatever it is, it's it's under 20. So um, keep that in mind when you're, when you're thinking about playing diplomatically. One thing you can do, which the enemy or which other factions are really not going to like, if you don't want to do the justify war goal and declare war and spend time on it, this is the strat that I used when I did my total war campaign that we're in the middle of right now. Just take your army, come into the territory, and just trespass. And they'll give you a warning. Are we... I think we're allied with these guys. Yeah, we're allied with these guys. Uh, anyways, so... Just seeing where they went. 
So you just go into their territory. It's not going to take long. It'll take, you know, one or two hours. They'll give you a warning. You say whatever you want. We can, I guess we'll just do an example of it because, I mean, we're here. So these guys, we don't have any faction. We don't have any um, treaties with them. They're at 8%. Plus 8%. So let's take a look at these numbers. I'm not going to remember exactly what they were. But I want to see how much it changes after one war. After one... So we... So this was given to us right away. So war is imminent. They gave us the warning. We're still here. Oh no, we're at war. Wow, they... Uh, so look at the... Look at the diplomacy right now. Everybody... Like, we, I can't believe we still have trade agreements here. They're going to cancel those soon. There's no way they're going to keep those up. We even lost our alliance. We lost everything. That's, so that's like, that's not an ideal way to declare war on somebody is just to ambush them like that. But even if you go the route of, oh, we have a battle here. Uh, even if you go the route of justifying a war goal and declaring war, you're going to affect it's you're going to greatly affect your relationship with all the other factions to the point where one or one or two wars you declare war on one or two maybe three if that's pushing it you're going to be at negative 100 percent or close to it you're going to be at least in the red with everybody and then so my point is that hinders your trade um, i'm just going to auto this we're going to lose but um, I'm just trying to, this isn't obviously something that we're going to be continuing on with. Uh, an error has occurred. Apologies. Which we didn't even, we didn't. So this is what will give us the option. So it'll say, yeah, sorry. Or we can say, no, too bad. We're staying here and whatever. But I think because our troops accidentally attacked the city. All right. So that's pretty much it for diplomacy and trade we still have trade somehow i mean i'm surprised these guys haven't canceled it so right now if we were in this situation just think of the amount of time it's going to take to improve relations with one faction to get them to like us enough for another trading agreement for the random supplies that it puts in here so here we go here's a good example so aluminum ore Oh, man, that's pretty expensive. Um, I don't know if relationships affect the price because 32 aluminum ore for $2,000, that's pretty crazy. That's a very small number. That's it. That's the only other option. That's that's it. So now, you know, 32 is nothing. 32 aluminum isn't going to last you very long. Um, so so that that's kind of my rant on how the game almost forces you to play aggressively unless you really want to spend a lot of time staring at, like I said, staring at this screen like you're, um, you know, if you take over this this faction here, you have two two factions, you've ruined all of your relationships, you're going to have to spend all that time with each faction to like to get them to like you enough to get the trade agreements to still not have all the resources that you need because again you're only going to have iron and aluminum uh you're still going to have to hope for copper and oil and then um and then move on from there if you were lucky and you had i mean if you could conquer enough territory to where you had those those roadblocks or those foundation blocks for building an army and then do the diplomatic side that's another way you could play. But for me, by the time you're at war with everyone, you're you're getting the the you're getting so much resources from the enemy if you're victorious in battle. Um like look at Sambro. No, not Sambro. The Faro. So look at everything here. If we went over here up north and conquered their capital city, they're going to have pretty much the same resources that we have. So we're going to double everything that we have in our inventory now, plus everything that's in their their other cities, because they're going to have a military city and they're going to have um, 
they might have something in their airfield and in their their um their farm here so why would i wait around doing it diplomatically when i can double my resources in a few quick battles like it, uh, it's that's where i mean where the game kind of forces you to play aggressively but that's pretty much it for diplomacy as far as i know you can make an armistice Armistice is never 100%. I can send $10,000 to bribe. Again, we only start off with 33. So $10,000 for a 90% chance. So can you imagine that not hitting at 100%? We've all had the RNG gods against us in our in our lifetime. So, you know, that's not a guarantee. And It'll just take the war away. They're still going to hate you and still have minus 100%. So you're going to have to improve relations so they don't declare war on you. And some of these factions might declare war on you just because they don't like you right now. So you're trying to improve relations with other factions while your relations are depleting with the other ones that don't like you already. And then they declare war on you. So it... You're kind of hemmed in with what you can do in the game and how you can do it by the diplomatic side. Right. I'm going to touch on economics quickly because it's... I'm not going to make its own tab. Um, I don't really come into the screen. I don't really know what's going on here. Uh, fish. There's What I know is there's fish here. I've never seen fish in the game. Uh, same with coal. I've never seen coal. I've just noticed that right now. I've seen the fish, but I've never seen... I've seen the fish in this queue, but I've never seen coal. So that must be something in the future. But uh, if somebody knows exactly what this is, I've never used it. I've never found it useful. So I don't even worry about it. Like It, it might help you in like trade or stuff like that, but... You can't, as far as I know, um, put stuff in the trade for the other factions. So if I if I see something that has a high sell value, I can't be like, oh, you know, stone's going for like 10 times its worth coming to here. Like I can't put stone in the trade queue manually. Like it might go in there randomly. I don't know. So I'm not exactly sure what this represents or what it's good for. All right, so what we're going to talk about next is everything to do, well, everything that I can think of about uh, this infantry screen here, how to build them, how to kit them out, uh, what, everything to do with pretty much the screen on the left-hand side. So we have, if you come down here, you have your two battalion, well, your battalion list, so you can go on your 68 battalion, you double click, just like your city, it'll take them to them. Uh, click on them once, it's going to give you just the uh, squad list. So if you want to create a battalion, I, you need to have an empty city. So I can't create a battalion in Verma right now because we have a battalion in here right now. And you can tell that by this little shield here. So the 68 battalion right now is garrisoning verma and you can tell by the shield so if i go into verma it's not giving me the option to uh, build anything build any troops you can go into this tab here and it'll take you to the force you can see the supply of the force of your of your battalion here and then you can see the garrison if you click on garrison it'll go back to the garrison of the city which we don't have one here um, you can create one. We've gone over that briefly in earlier in the video. You just create it like any other squad, which we're going to go over now. So let's take the let's take the 68 battalion out of Verma. So they're going to sit there. Now you can see it has these this icon create battalion. So you click on that. It's going to create. Uh, force here i don't know why it chose police but that's fine it, it doesn't matter we're going to be deleting him anyways so now you have options down here to create a standard squad 
uh, police squad. I mean, you can use police squads in your army if you want to. It, it's not advisable. It, it's, it's all the same. It's just they're going to be using different uniforms. And usually you want to do your police for your garrison units, I guess you could say. And you can create a militia squad. So it, this is a little bit confusing. I don't think these are very fleshed out properly yet. Um, because we clicked on standard squad for uh, to create one, it gave us a militia. We click on militia, it gives us militia. MP is the one that works. Um, so I'm going to just delete this for a second. Because I wanted to show you. So we're going to... So if you delete anything... It just goes into the city, back into the city that you deleted the unit in. If I delete this unit here, it's going to put the supplies in the closest city. So it'll send them to Verma. Um, so we're going to create battalion. It created a police. I don't know what causes you to build a standard squad. The only understanding that I have is if I have a regular... Um, uniform for them. So as you can see down this tree, we have police, militia, regular, and spec ops. So if I, all I, all I have in this city, if I click on it, is police and militia units or militia uniforms. So it's only going to give me those two units. I have to research the regular and the spec ops to get the appropriate infantry coming in. So what we're doing now we're building units. I'm surprised there's no vehicles. So it will always prioritize vehicles first. If I if I come in here, Affirmative. let's do this. Um, hold on. Hang on. Roger. So as you can see, this unit's out of fuel. You can see by the little gas tank here. And as you can also notice too, he's moving a lot slower. Affirmative. So that's regular speed, that's out of fuel speed. They'll still move, they'll just move at an extremely slower rate. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just move this unit into here first. So he's in here. If you wanna delete any of these units, just hit the delete squad. It's going to delete whatever unit you're on. You can delete whatever you want. If you wanna delete the whole squad, come down here and it's going to delete everyone. The point of that was, so I deleted those um, Bradleys, which what's the, these are what they are, the Bradleys, and the infantry units in them. So if I, if I delete this squad, it's going to put all these weapons and all the ammunition involved, all the uniforms um, and the vehicle and the vehicle's ammunition back into the city that you deleted it in. So we're going to move the 76 out. And we're going to slowly move the 125th Battalion back in. Okay, so he's he's in the city. He's got his shield. How we want to replenish him with his fuel is just rearmament re re of the battalion. So now he is fully, fuel, fully fueled, ready to go. That's also going to replenish any ammunition um, for your units as well. So now that he's here... And now that we have the Bradleys in here, I just wanted to demonstrate that it's always going to put vehicles first. Um, I can click on, I guess the militia is going to be, I just like, I'm trying to get rid of these trucks, but we have like, how many trucks do we have? Seven more. Okay. <laughs> so I need to clean this up a little bit for this demonstration. I don't know why we're using police uniforms as well. So it's 20 here. I'm just going to let some time pass so it refreshes. Okay, it's at 1. I'm going to get rid of some of these trucks. Because we have 26 trucks here. As you can see, 26. Um, we have... Yeah, that's, that's a lot of trucks. I never really use them because I don't use infantry. So let's get... Let's send them wherever. I don't care where. We'll just keep... Oh, no. We're going to keep... Um, 20 we'll keep two of them so we'll send that out okay we have two trucks left just 
just waiting for day. So now that we have control of the battalion, we will click on create standard squad. It's always going to put um, vehicles first, trucks second, and then infantry last. At least if you hit standard squad. You hit militia, it's going to give you trucks, and then it's going to give you um, your vehicles, and then it's going to give me infantry. No matter what I press now, I'm going to give infantry because I don't have any trucks left to give out. But just remember that no matter what, you can't... It's, it's always going to build those vehicles first uh, before your infantry. If you don't want these vehicles in this army, you just delete them. Or build out your army. So let's say I wanted a full infantry squad. I don't know why, but, um, so I would just fill it out. So the max you can have is 30 units. So 30 units, 30 squads with 10 units in each. So we have 30 units. Um, if you just wanted infantry, you could, you would have to delete the vehicles move I'm thinking this out I just realized how cumbersome this is so if I add anything it's going to add the vehicles so you would have to move this guy out you would have to create another battalion so we create another battalion to put the Bradley in one of the vehicles you would have to add all of the vehicles until you got to infantry okay move him out move him no we don't want to do that that's going to merge them Okay, move him in. So now give him the rest of the infantry here. So now this is a full infantry battalion if we didn't want to do that. So that, that's the only real way you can uh, specialize your units if you don't want vehicles. That's the same with if, you know, let's say we had, what tier, what vehicles are those? So we had Humvees. We had a ton of Humvees and a ton of Leopard 1 tanks in this city. And we wanted to have the Humvees out. We would have to go through the tanks first, and then the Humvees would come out, and then we would have to go through and delete all of the tanks. And then if we wanted infantry, we would have to do the same process where we made a battalion of just tanks to get them out of the city so that when you're building your battalion, it's not going to put them in a in priority because it's always going to build the tanks. It's always going to build the heaviest um, vehicle you have first and then go down the list until it gets to infantry. And so we have our... So we're going to delete these policemen because it, we don't want that. And once you delete... So we were at 30. Um, we deleted a unit. It's When we were at 30, it didn't give us the option to build anything. So you have to back out and refresh the screen. So now we can add that 30. And now that 30 is an actual militia unit. It's not a police unit. And so how replenishment works. Again, you can go into your squad editor and kit them out how you want your infantry squads to be. So you would have to go to militia infantry squad because these are not motorized squads this is an infantry militia squad oh so militia infantry you would have to kit them out how you want them uh save it for god's sakes please save it before you leave and then whatever you give them that's what it's going to prioritize to give them but if you don't have the like, if, if I give them car 98s, which is actually a good weapon. I mean, I've mopped up with that weapon before. If I don't have car 98s in here, which we do, but let's say these car 98s weren't in here, it's going to give them something else. And it'll usually prioritize your best weapons first. As you can see, I mean, we're giving out our MK18s first. Now, that's for the first squad member of each unit. So... Um, we've also given out some SA-80s, which are good guns. Uh, the FAL, which is a good gun. It's not as good as the other two, but as you can see, it's prioritizing the best weapon. I don't know why it's giving out cars. I mean, cars are a good weapon, but it's definitely not as good as the MK-18. So, 
Uh, I'm not sure why that happened, but it did. And so if you wanted a squad with, so one thing you got to think about. So yes, we have 30 squads, but now we need to fill the squad with 10 infantry. And the way that works is it's going to, so first of all, if you want to fill them up, you need manpower. So one, one squad member out of here. So we can click on this now. There's two people in this squad. So Oliver and Julian. It'll show you the gun they're using, the uniform they're using, the ammunition that they're using, and how much they have, if they have an RPG, and how many rockets they have with them. So that's one thing to look at. Um, so to build that, it's pulling, you can click between these two as well. Um, so it's pulling from the manpower, the uniform, to build those units. So every time you build, so when, when Julian Brown was built, when he was built. It took one reservist, one militia, and one car 98 out of our inventory with the ammunition and the RPGs and the rockets. And that's what created him. So you you need to have the appropriate equipment to make units. The one thing that's not shared, I said this before in the video, the one thing that is not shared even on easy resource management is your reservists, your uniforms, and your weapons. So you need to be in the city if you want to build a battalion or rearm your forces or replenish your losses. You need to be in a city with at, with reservists. Um, technically not uniforms because it'll give them guerrilla uniforms by default. Um, those are just given if you don't have it but you you definitely need reservists in the city weapons and that's it you can give weapons without ammo i have i have had that where i've built squads i've brought them into battle and i've tried to i've once i've controlled once i've gone into first person with them i'm like good grief they don't they have a freaking weapon with no ammo so they're totally useless so you you all you really need to build an infantry unit is weapons and manpower, reservists. So, Fiskadel. So, let's see. So, Grova, it has reservists, but it doesn't have any weapons. So, it's not going to use those reservists unless there's a weapon to give them. Not the ammunition, just the weapon. And Bobilio, so there's no manpower, there's no weapons here. So, I can't, it's not even giving me the option to create anything. Same with uh, Grova. Even though it has reservists, it's not giving me the option to build to build a battalion. And even if even if there was a battalion there, it's not going to replenish. It's not so we have two out of ten. Now we have three out of ten. So it's slowly replenishing this unit. It just gave this guy a shotgun with shotgun shells, Mr. David Clark. It's not going to replenish those losses, like I said, unless they have reservists and a weapon to give them. Not ammunition. So you got to make sure that you have ammunition for the weapons that you're using for your units. Also, another thing to note is that if you want to re resupply a unit, it's always going to take the top unit first. So it's going to fill out the 28th militia squad up to 10. Then it's going to go down to the 29th. It's going to fill them out to 10 and so on and so on down. Let's say you have... What I like to do with my vehicles, when I'm in a desperate time or when I when I don't have the time to give them all the infantry, like max them out to 10, what I'll do, especially with my 50 cal or like my, my infantry fighting vehicles, I'll just put two in there so that there's one guy driving, because you need a guy driving and you need a guy shooting. So if I only had, if this only had one unit, one out of 10 units, you can, you can give it orders to drive, and it'll drive itself to the location that you want it to go to, but there won't be anybody in the gunner seat. And you can't switch out, like, driver to gunner or gunner to driver. It's You can unload that driver and use him as an infantryman, but you can't, like, switch seats inside of the vehicle. And it'll always prioritize driver, then gunner, then uh just support 
infantry. There's really no other slot that they can go into. So the minimum that I would suggest for your infantry fighting vehicles is two. So you have one guy to drive and one guy to shoot. Tanks, I like to have one because the AI has a really hard time conserving ammunition. So if I put two, if I had a gunner in this tank, or if I had two people in this tank, it'd be one to drive and one to shoot. And so you would put him on the front line, let, you know, let him go, go do something else, go control somebody else. It's going to shoot like all of its main, its main gun ammo with its coaxial against like single infantry units. And that's just a total waste. And you don't have a large supply of those shells, those main shells. And I'm not producing ammunition for these tanks because I didn't build the tanks. I stole them from, well, I didn't steal them from the enemy. I, I captured them from the enemy through battles. So I'm not even producing ammo for these tanks. So I don't want the AI wasting it all. And um, then I have a tank with no main guns. The only way I'm replenishing, <clears throat> excuse me, these tanks ammo is when I'm conquering cities with the ammo type from the enemy. And you have to be cautious because when you're dealing with different different factions, so different, so this is a democracy faction. So if I'm going to be fighting against a communist faction, they're going to be using different tanks with different ammunition. So my understanding is this is the communist or this, this is the, um, oh, I don't want to give bad information. One of these slots is communist and one of these slots is democracy. The, the democracy and communist tanks do not use the same ammunition. So it's the only reason why these things are supplied after using them a few times is because I'm capturing their cities and they have ammunition there for me that I'm taking from there. So that's another thing to keep in mind too. Me personally with tanks, I don't like the AI. I don't mind there being somebody in there to drive. Well, by default, there's always going to be one. Like once you build a unit, there's there's one, there's one out of 10. So there's always going to be a driver. But same with, same with any sort of heavy vehicle that's using heavy ammunition. I don't like the AI um, using, going ahead and firing their main guns because they, they don't know how to prioritize targets. And their accuracy is bad as well, t to be honest. Um, so I said that, so what I would do is I would move all my tanks down so they're not going to be replenished. Unfortunately, this guy has two in them. But, so, if I want a second, if I want a gunner, if I want a gunner into this, so we have one out of ten with this infantry fighting vehicle, there's a 50 cal turret on the top of this vehicle. It's an open turret, so it's, you know, your guy can die up there. But, so we have one out of ten. If I want to put a, let's say we're like really strapped on time and I'm like, oh my god, the enemy's coming in. I need to get my units equipped as quick as possible. I want to put him up at the top. To prioritize him so now he's going to get the next reinforcement I can move him down here because these guys are full and he's still gonna get it I can even move him down here doesn't matter like these guys are full so they're not getting anything else but this guy is going to be the next one to be oh we got being invaded how dare they I'm just gonna auto that so this is going to be the next unit that is replenished it's going to give one person. Oh, no, it's not because we're not in the Roger city. That. Good. Affirmative. There, I just gave it to him. So there's two. So it'll fill them out to 10 and it'll make its way down here. But my suggestion is with your infantry fighting vehicles to have at least two people in there. One driving and one in a 50 cal uh, opening up so you don't have to manual them. Even the LAVs, they're the only time I don't recommend... I mean, you can... You can this is just a recommendation the way I play, is that with your with your tanks or anything that's using heavy shells, like this uh, M1128, I think that's a anti-tank unit. Um, I wouldn't. I would only put one in, because I would r much rather manual them and conserve their ammunition and use it wisely than the AI just free. You know, using a tank shell for one infantry guy. It's a complete waste of ammo. So that's how you replenish. And as you can see, 10 out of 10, everybody's, it kind of randomized what it gave them with these weapons because I didn't, I don't have a squad editor. I didn't worry about it. Their ammunition, 
everything. Um, how to merge units. Oh, and to replenish them. You need, you can just go into, so with easy resource management, which would I, which is what I play on, I can be in Verma, which is where all of my resources is. But let's say we were in Hepala. We talked about this earlier. Um, there's no ammunition or fuel here, but even if this army was in Hepala, I could rearm the battalion and it will replenish their ammunition and fuel to the extent of what you have in your global um, inventory. So it, it'll just take what it can from anywhere. Now on the higher difficulty, the, the, the higher resource management difficulty levels, um, you're going to have to have the ammunition in the city that you're in um, to replenish your units. But like I said, reservists and weapons are not in that global pool that it'll pull from. You have to be in the city for that. You can also merge units. So if I take this unit and click him over here, you'll get that little circle. You'll bring him in and you can just move units over as much as you want. Um, you can make, I mean, just, you know, whatever you want to do. Just hit accept and you'll have your two units. Also, you have experience. Uh, obviously, you get that through battle. I don't know if... If you lose it through 86 Battalion. I don't know if you lose it through combining units like that. Uh, that's something to test out, but it might be something to be wary of. So, um, I think that's it for the infantry side of things. So now we're going to be talking about the battle side of things. So we're going to be going into the battle screen and seeing how everything works. So as you can see, we have a little rebel force here. We're going to attack them with the 16 stack. Um, as you can see, we're pretty well equipped. This is probably the best army that I have at this point in the game. Again, our tanks, I don't have anyone in there. These labs are pretty good. I could probably use a bit more reinforcement down here, but... Uh, as it stands now, um, we're good to go. If you look on the left side, you see this single single pip. And as you scroll down, you get two. And when you go... So this is a 30 stack. So this is the max number of units you can have. But again, each unit is going to have 10. We just haven't replenished this guy. So as you scroll down, you can see it goes from 2 to 3. And so this is 10 units. Once you get to 10 units, you go to, you know, uh, your Roman numerals too. So that's your other 10 units and then your other 10 units, which equals 30. And that represents the units that are going to be on the field. So <clears throat> when we go into battle, uh, this is a, I wanted to touch on, um, one more thing with the infantry that let's say, my recommendation for building a, a, a battalion is not to do it this way. My suggestion would be to build them one at a time and let because right now this infantry squad, it has, so this guy started out with an MK-18, depending on your resources, of course. So if we look in here, MK-18s. I don't think we have any left. We don't. So that means that it's going to give them other random weapons. So my personal preference is I like my squads to have the same weapon type if possible. It's not always possible. So what I would do instead is make one squad at a time and use all these weapons that it's used for the, f like, all, like if I use all the weapons it's it's used for these single um, unit squads to fill up this squad here and then you know create another one because it'll use the same weapons if possible so it'll give like we have enough for two and a half squads of FAMASs we have a ton of AKMS mods not very good gun though um, 
the M4A1s. So what I would recommend is make a squad one at a time so that you're filling out the squad sort of with the same weapon type. And also, like this is kind of really, you're not, you might not even have enough manpower or weapons to fill all it out. It'll let you build them. Like it'll let you build one out of 10 squads if you have one weapon, but it might only fill up, you know, half of these units with weapons and ammo. It'll, whatever you have in here. And then the rest will just be sing like one out of 10, like single squads, totally unequipped that are, that are kind of useless. So my recommendation is to build one squad at a time. But um, we're going to head into this battle here. So we clicked on we clicked on our 82nd Battalion here. We're ready to go. We know he's full on ammunition because we have a full blue bar here. So the NATO symbols ring true. So we have armor, like all these. This is just the NATO symbols of the units. Um, we have the actual unit itself. It'll tell you what it is, what armor limit it's using. You can also see that ammunition is at 100%. You can also represent that through this blue line. So if you're 50% ammo, this bar will be at, you know, halfway down. It'll kind of give you a gauge. But uh, as you can see, we are ready to go. Everyone's, yeah, everyone, this, this, we're ready for this fight, definitely, against um, these rebels. So you just click on the battalion. Make sure you have them. Click on the unit that you want. My recommendation is to not fight at night because... The only thing that's going to, all nighttime battles are going to do is to hinder hinder your visibility. The AI has no issue trying to find you at night, but uh, yeah, especially infantry. Infantry are very hard to spot at night. Vehicles, you can see, enemy vehicles you can see um, because they use their headlights, and you can turn your headlights on and off by pressing the L key, but uh, infantry are hard to spot. So your like your units that you're not controlling, if they have someone in a turret gunner, they don't have an issue finding um, infantry. It's kind of like the enemy AI where um, they can see. It's just like like the night doesn't bother them. But if you're going to manual a unit and you kind of want to do some flanking maneuvers or kind of you know take control of a certain sector and hold some people back, you might have a hard time seeing the infantry on your own. So. My recommendation is to look at the clock and make sure you're attacking at night. One thing to note is that nighttime battles are after 8 o'clock. So if you're past 20 hundred hours, you're going to be into a night battle. So try and... And I'm not sure what the morning is. I think it's 6. I could be wrong on that. It's 6 or 7. So make sure you're attacking between like 6 in the morning and 8 at night. 20 hundred hours. So we'll click on our unit, we'll click on them, we're going to attack uh, through the day. The map is determined on your location, so if we're in a city, or close to a city, it's going to give us a city map, and if we're in a farm area, it'll give us sort of like a, a farm map. If we're in the middle of nowhere, it might give you a wide open map or a very thick map. Like if I'm in, I don't know if the game is smart enough where if I'm in like in this thick forest, it's going to give me a forest map. I've never really noticed. So uh, just you, depending on what you're using, you might want to pick the terrain that is more suitable to how you want to fight the battle, if possible. So when you attack the enemy, you get to see what's coming in. So the rebels, they have 60 soldiers and 40 or four vehicles. Thank God they don't have 40 vehicles. So as you can see, they have... Um, an anti-vehicle, an anti-infantry vehicle, two of them, two trucks, so they have two motorized trucks that will be carrying infantry, and then these symbols are infantry squads. Um, we're going to be bringing in, I don't know exactly what these symbols are, uh, to me they're mechanized units, so these are our Bradleys here. These are anti-infantry fighting vehicles, like the vehicles with turrets on top or just 50 cals. Um, we have our tank unit, and uh, this is an anti-air unit here, that symbol. So you can either auto. 
I'd never recommend auto, even if they had, let's say we had a full squad of 300 men against 60. You're going to take at least 100% more casualties and expend 100% more ammunition when the battle, when you, if you auto, than you would if you manual. I never recommend autoing under any circumstance. I don't care if there's two people in here. I've autoed with two people with an army like this, and I've lost vehicles. So I would never recommend autoing. I know that's very tedious, especially when it's going to be a blowout like this map, like this battle is going to be. But I would highly recommend manualing every single battle, never auto. So what we're going to do is head in. All right, so this is the map. We can scroll around, we can look around. As you can see with our options, so under options, gameplay, uh, number of units, we have maxed out. So we're at 200. That means we can have 10 units. So we have 10 units here. You can hotkey them. Um, you can do whatever you, you can hotkey kind of whatever you want. Over here you have um, your hotkeys as well. Uh, there is there is um, open squad menu. I never really used it. Uh, I don't even have it as a key. But you can open up that menu and give individual squads certain orders. Again, I've never used it. But so as you can see, um, our ten units. So if you remember, if you remember when we were looking at our um, infantry menu in the campaign map, those. Uh, um, Roman numerals. So, if you remember, the one represents those are the those are the ten units that you're going to put into battle, and you can move them around to whatever you want. Uh, I can show that. I probably should have showed that before. We can show it after, but uh, you can you can decide who you want your top ten to be, and when you lose a unit, let's say this unit's destroyed, um, well. Even though this unit has the vehicle, so number one, number one's always at the front. So if this Bradley gets destroyed, it still has, so we can unload the infantry. So it still has those 10 infantry. Oh god, we're taking fire. <laughs> uh, the Bradley is probably going to take care of that. So that, as you can see, like, like where's that vehicle? We have another one coming here. So here's that troop transport truck. So what I was trying to say is... Um, so this unit also has 10 infantry in it, or whatever... I, I think it started off with 10, 10 infantry. I can't remember what, what uh, was in the queue. So once this Bradley is destroyed, and the infantry that are along with it, it will... It will bring in reinforcements for something else. Uh, whatever was next in the queue on that uh, infantry menu. So as you can see here, we're clicking on number four. Right now it's showing that all the infantry is inside of um, the vehicle except one. And we can take control of him by pressing F. Uh, you can first person people. You can, uh, you know, you can, just like any other game, if you press shift, you can zoom in. Um, if you, for me, scrolling the wheel opens up the weapons menu, so you can you know, open up your RPG, uh, which are very, very good units. One thing to note for your binoculars, if you can see on the bottom left corner, that is pretty much the infantry count. So we have 105 units left out of 107, so we've lost two, and the infant and the enemy has 41 units out of 60, that so they've lost a couple. One thing above that is we can see that little helicopter down there uh, with the number three. So that means we have three airstrikes. The way to activate those airstrikes... God. We're lighting up something over there. We're actually losing infantry. I don't know what we're shooting at, but we're throwing a lot of hate down there. So one thing you could do is go into your binoculars. And now hit F10. You can see the little F10 by the helicopter. It'll give you this attack menu, and you hit your left mouse, left mouse button. Sorry, your right one. 
and it'll bring in an airstrike somewhere along that area. It's not extremely accurate, but uh, it will come in. Give it a few seconds. So, yep, there we go. Little airstrike. Helicopters aren't that good. I would highly recommend jets. Jets are a lot better. Um, and we can go back in. You can use that with any infantry unit. You can take control of any infantry unit, any unit uh, that you want. So again, but right now, so if we hit, you can hit B for binoculars. Um, F10 for, oh, no, hold on. Let's go into the binoculars because just so we get better accuracy. Uh, press F10 to activate the airstrike. And as you can see, we have two airstrikes left. Hit the left mouse button and there we go. Another thing with your binoculars. So the game's got a glitch right now where you'll lose your iron sights. Um, if I go out, back out, and back in, you can see it's a bug in the game where I've lost my iron sights. So that's really not a good thing. It's a glitch that's been in the game for a while. As you can see, there's no magazine in the gun. There's no butt stock on the gun. And there's no iron sight. And, you know, the top of the, the barrel right there, like, what I'm aiming at is not accurate. It's going to be a lot higher than that. So for long distance shooting, this is this is totally not good. But it's a bug in the game. Hopefully it gets patched out quick. One way you can fix that is by going back into your binoculars and then going back to your gun. And, you know, your iron sights will come back. So my I have a mouse... Uh, a side button on my mouse and that's what zooms me back out to the campaign map but if I want to go back into the last unit that I had activated I click that same button again and it'll take me back unfortunately it takes away his iron sight so you know go back into your binoculars press B back out again and another thing to note too uh, so I have my ammunition on the right hand side you can see the right bottom corner so I have 30 bullets in this magazine out of 400. We have auto. You can change that by pressing V, at least for me. You can change it to semi or auto. And that goes the same with your vehicles. If I go to my Bradley here, press F for manual control. Um, press right mouse button to go into first person. And then press shift to zoom. Um, so as you can see on the bottom, my primary weapon, I have 31 out of 85. Press V for my coaxial, so I have 5 out of 1,800 rounds. And he already fired off his two rockets, so this, this Bradley comes with like two rockets that are great against vehicles. Also, we have a smoke available. I never use that. I don't even know what the button is. I'm sure it's in the hockey somewhere. And then that 4,895, that's our hit points. So that's how many um, so much hit points we can take. Uh, it, each weapon, I mean, this thing can take one RPG round directly, so RPGs are pretty powerful. Um, and that's one thing that, if you're going to use a, a vehicle-focused battalion, which is what I use, I don't use any infantry squads, I think they're totally useless, um, you just need to keep your distance far enough away from the enemy. And if you watch, if you watch my videos and you watch some of this, the series that I do, you can see the tactics that I use to defeat the enemy with vehicles. Um, and the proof is in the pudding. Some people um, think, I don't know, I, sometimes I get grief for how uh, my strategies work and what I use to defeat the enemy, but um, I maybe lose a battle one out of 20, 30 times. So I think my strategies are, are pretty fair. But one thing I wanted to show, so we have infantry here, we have our old P90. Um, again, all the controls are the same. Zoom. I don't know if the P90 has a separate firing mode. No. Um, so let's say I took damage. You look at the bottom right corner. I'm at 100%. Uh, all I need to do is zoom out again and zoom back in. And it'll replenish my ammo. Again, as you can see, the P90 is missing its magazine. It doesn't have an iron sight. Um, it's totally messed up. So what I need to do is go back into binoculars. All your infantry will have binoculars. You don't need to equip them with that, but just go into your binoculars and come back out and you'll equip them again. So that's kind of a bug with the health and with the iron sights. So if I, like again, like I said before, if I was fighting and I was at, like it says 100% there, but let's say, you know, I got hit a few times and I'm at 20%. If I zoom out, zoom back in, he'll be at 100%. So that bug might be patched out and might, you know, 
that might not be in the game forever. One thing you need to worry about here, as well as infantry sitting on top of your vehicles, they are vulnerable. Um, okay, so the enemy retreated because they, they lost. Usually around 20 and under, you have a high chance of them surrendering. So we won that battle. It gives you a little bit of a breakdown. Uh, I don't know if there's anything really else that I want to explain about battle. Um, we should probably, yeah, there's a few things. So if we go back in here, uh, like I said before, you have your, your ones. So those, these top 10 units are the ones that were, that were in battle and you can move these around. You know, I can put my tank at the top to make sure he's in the next battle and he'll be first in that convoy line. Um, also, you can, uh, whatever you move, so if I move this lav here and replace the tank, the tank's going to take the place of the unit that I'm trying to move. So it'll put him here, right? So if I move these guys, they're just going to keep substituting each other. So that's how you kind of control. I mean, when you have 30 units in here, you might have guys that are low on ammunition or they, you know, they're depleted in squads. So you might want to move your... Um, units that are at full strength near the top and replace the ones that are, you know, depleted until you can get back to a place where you can, you know, rearm them and resupply them. So that's, that's how that works. So just, just remember these numbers on the side and that'll tell you. So like I said before, the top 10 here, if I lose one of the units, so the whole units wiped out all 10 units or, you know, this is one out of 10. So if that single unit was wiped out, it's going to take the next one in the second line. So this unit's going to be coming in to replace it and then so on and so forth. It's going to move down the line. Um, yeah, let's head in here for a second. I just want to explain a couple more things. Oh, our strikers are finished. Good. This is an early campaign that I'm, this campaign is up on the channel now. Uh, I mentioned it before, so if you want to check that out, uh, you are welcome to. It's our total war campaign, so we're at war with everybody. Um, I, if you if you watch the di diplomatic section of this, I just took a single unit and just ran around uh, trespassing in everybody's territory to the point where they declared war on me. I didn't do it diplomatically, so that's that's one way to. Um, declare an early war so it's 1300 hours let's head in so it's it's 1500 so it's three o'clock we still got plenty of daylight left let's head in so again this is a actual army here this is i wouldn't have fought this on normal circumstances well maybe yeah possibly so we're fighting in a port city um it'll tell you what the enemy has it doesn't tell you how many numbers are in each unit but these are these these diamonds with the single lines are infantry units, but they are depleted infantry units. You can tell that they're under strength because really what they should have is an, is another line, like the X, like right here. This is a full strength infantry unit. So this, this battalion is depleted. So we don't, like, I've seen, I've seen enemy units with tanks. So this is a tank unit here. We know that through that NATO symbol. Um, the tank will just have a driver. So it'll just be, I'll be like all scared. I'll be like, oh my God, a tank's coming towards me. Like, what am I going to do? I'm out of position, but there's nobody in the gunner seat. The AI didn't wait long enough to put somebody to, to replenish that unit enough to have a gunner. So it's just run. It's just driving around, um, without anyone shooting so that, you know, it's kind of a good scenario for you. It's kind of good, but kind of bad because in those situations, the AI tends to, uh, beeline it for your for your units so that it gets destroyed i mean ideally you would want you want to try and capture as many units as you can the infantry so the units will surrender if like as the battle progresses you'll have infantry that surrender you'll you'll see that by them kneeling on the ground with their hands up uh, you don't want to kill them because those are more infantry that will be put into your reserve at the end of the battle so whatever supplies that are left over from the battle and also any surrendering units will be yours. The, 
you'll capture them and they'll fight for you. If you, you know, it'll just, they'll just be reservist, uh, available for recruitment. But, uh, yeah, you kind of want to like, sometimes I'll play to the point where I'll have armor firing on my units, but I know that the battle's going to end quickly. So I try and destroy as much infantry as possible so that they'll surrender so that, and because any vehicle that isn't destroyed, you get, even if it's not on the map, um, yet once the enemy surrenders, it, anything that's left over is yours. So we'll enter this. I just want to explain a few things on some of the controls and some of the tactics that you might want to use. I don't know if I'll have time though, because this is, needs to be a quick battle. So as you can see, we have our lav here. Uh, we do have infantry inside the lab. One way to dismount them is, for me, I press H. It'll dismount them if you want to put them back in. Click on the unit, and you'll get that little door icon. Uh, just click on it, and they'll enter back inside. That's one way if you have an open turret system like like this unit here. Uh, I'll dismount them because they're not. I don't want them sitting on top of a vehicle like that. But this turret gunner can you know, be killed. He's vulnerable. He's sitting out in the open. So if he dies, I'll click on the unit and I'll just put every, I'll put everybody back in there. And the first person in will take that slot of the gun. So you want to be careful of that. And also what I like to do is I like to see where the enemy's spawning in from so that I can position my forces to try and get a few spawn kills. Um, Just trying to think of what else I can explain here. Uh, so we have our vehicle here. I press F. You can manually control it. Um, you can move around. I still have infantry in here. You press left mouse button and shift, and you know, zoom in. Fire R for reload. You'll see that red bar there. Once that red bar is, is depleted, that means you're reloaded. Uh, this vehicle, like I said. I've demonstrated before with the Bradley. It doesn't have a secondary option. So V there. Um, with tanks. With... What's this thing? So that's an AA gun. With this, I don't think our LAVs are going to be able to destroy it. We need to either get around it or to... F get, with any sort of armor, the rear is weak. There are weak spots on the tank and the rear of the tank is weak. So what you can do if you're having, if you don't have the, I mean, you're not going to kill it with small arms. So this, I don't know if we have any infantry fighting vehicles in this army. Yes, yeah, see what our tank's doing? So our tank has 50 rounds and he's firing it at infantry. So that's a big waste of ammunition. One thing you're, one behavior that the AI will have is it will always fire on vehicles before infantry. So even the striker here, the striker, all it has is the 50 cal on top. So it only has the small arms. So obviously, you're not going to do anything to tanks with this weapon. But even though I can't do anything against tanks, it's, it's still going to shoot at, and it will shoot at vehicles if possible. This thing's lighting up the area. That thing's pretty sweet. So that's one thing you need to kind of watch out for with your vehicles is that they're not firing at um, other vehicles that it can't destroy. When I'm talking about getting behind a tank to kill it, I'm talking about, you know, these cannon rounds that this LAV are firing or um, this anything that that is using, you know, shells and not just straight bullets. So this tank, I can take control of it. Try and, so that tank is way out there. It'll reload automatically. We just lost a bunch of infantry there. There, so we just destroyed that tank. And we can switch with V, switch the coaxial. Um, shift again, left shift is zoom in. Uh, I didn't realize that until a long time we played this game. Someone mentioned it to me uh, during the live stream, which is super helpful. And that's about it, I think, for combat. We're mopping these guys up. 
What I like to do is I like to get into a position where you kind of spawn kill them. I mean, this is obviously I'm not fighting this battle as I would if I was if I wasn't trying to do a tutorial. What I would usually do, what I would suggest is maybe getting on this high ground here with a few units to deal with whatever's in the city, and then get a few units over here um, on this high ground. High ground is king that would fire on all these units coming out of the spawn and absolutely destroy them. And they're bringing in some armor. You can't always see the enemy infantry or enemy vehicles coming in, uh, especially artillery. Sometimes artillery will, won't show up and you'll be wondering what the hell's firing on you. Um, it's usually in, uh, artillery, so you have to go hunt it down if possible. And that's pretty much it. For uh, fighting vehicles. So this Bradley only has one person in it, as you can see represented here. So I can move it up here, but it's not going to fire. The only the only one that's in there is a is a driver. So we would have to manually fire his gun. Same with that. Same with him. So this tank as well only has one person in it. This LAV is full. So you know. There is infantry in there, so if this vehicle gets blown up, all the infantry inside are going to die as well. So you have to keep that in mind when you're uh, fighting. You can unload them, so now they're vulnerable to, you know, all this fire coming in. All this um, tank fire and everything else. But, uh, you know, that's, that's your discretion, what you want to do if you want to keep them in or out. play this battle out just so I can show you the end screen. Uh, I need... I'm gonna pull this guy up. I'm not really concerned about ammunition so we can you know, use units that I might not use. This Bradley. I can't imagine how much tank shells this guy has left. He's used about half of the tank shells. And on what exactly? You know, it's, it's a big waste to have. Oh, we got RPGs. So this guy's got an RPG. Those are extremely deadly towards vehicles. You need to watch out for those. So you can stop. Well, our guys are firing RPGs. sure what. I'm going to bring him over. Firing tank rounds. Again, this isn't how I would have fought this battle if it was, you know, part of a campaign. One thing I can recommend too is try and knock down trees, kind of that are in your line of sight if you can, because your, your, um, your vehicles, <laughs> I have had vehicles where they will be in a position like right here. And they'll just unload like 500 rounds into a tree stump, trying to shoot at an enemy in that line of sight. So it is something to be to be wary of. I don't even know what these guys are firing at. Just infantry. Oh, there's a tank over here. So hopefully it doesn't look like there's anybody in this tank. So I wonder, see that's a situation where we don't want to blow him up. We kind of want to destroy the infantry. Uh, quicker so that we can capture this because as you can see our vehicles are prioritizing that tank and trying to destroy it which I would much rather if they focused on the infantry because if we kill 30 more infantry they're going to be close to surrender also um, these red red diamonds here so these are going to give us these symbols of what they are so again, this is a full infantry squad, so 10. And then these, like, the diamonds with the one line, those are depleted units. So it could have, you know, it doesn't really tell you how many, but it's not a full squad. I'm going to pull this vehicle up here so we can get a line of sight down this way. It's kind of vulnerable. I mean, they can fire those RPGs from, like, crazy distances. And it doesn't look like we're hitting anything over there anyways. So... 
Oh my god, I hope this guy doesn't have anyone in this turret. You can kind of tell if he's turning the turret and driving, but I don't think he has anybody inside. See, I'm going to manual this because sometimes the AI in your vehicles has a hard time selecting units. We know there's infantry over here, so we'll take care of these guys. Yeah, it's, it's going to be difficult not to destroy this vehicle. We can take control of the tank. I think it just blew up. Yeah, they just, some guy with an RPG just blew him up. So that's a shame. That means we're not going to be able to uh, capture that. Because he didn't have anyone in the gun, so there's no reason to destroy that unit. But I can't control what the AI does with RPGs. I'm just going to pull him over. Because we're at 27. We'll keep an eye on this number because we should see units surrendering soon. And this is where it's it's kind of a game of cat and mouse because I don't want to get too close to these infantry to where they have the opportunity to shoot an RPG at me. But I also, I don't know if they're going to move up. I'm surprised they're not surrendering, to be honest. There's 19, 19 of them left. It's always a different number, but usually 19 out of 150 is enough for them to, you know, think about their life choices. So this is kind of a risky call, but just for, you know, this, this demonstration, I'm just going to kind of rush them up here so I can get a better angle on them. But this isn't ideal. I mean, they could fire an RPG at me from there, no problem. So, as you can see, these guys are surrendering. Um, I can kill these guys without penalty in the battle screen, but as you can see, um, they're going to join our cause in a minute. So here we go. So they didn't, uh, so we captured 13. It doesn't show us in here. We captured 13 units. Um, we lost, well, we injured one, and we lost eight infantry, and we didn't lose any vehicles. And this is all the equipment that we gathered from the enemy as well. So it's kind of a little rundown of what happened and what you captured. If you captured any vehicles, they'd be in here as well. Unfortunately, we blew up that tank, which was unnecessary. So, excuse me. Um, yeah, you can't really control what the AI is going to do with their weapons. That's why I was I tried to take control of that tank. So... Um, it didn't fire at it, but then just some guy with an RPG fired and killed him. My, my, um, my thoughts on vehicles versus infantry is if you have your distance, vehicles are going to win every time. Yes, the infantry can get a lucky shot on you once in a while from far away, but Infantry's or vehicles are going to beat infantry every single time if you play them properly. And like I said, watch my videos, um, look at the tactics tactics that I use, and you'll be able to see why um, what I'm saying is true. So we use this unit. So now you can see that this guy has zero ammunition. That doesn't mean... Every, that just means his main gun, from my understanding, because I know he has uh, coaxial left. So this only represents the primary weapon. Same with the LAV. Uh, he has 31% of his primary weapon left. He probably still has 1,000 coaxial left. So just remember that when you're looking at these numbers. Um, so And again, as you can see, the blue bar is depleted to, to short, sort of represent what that... Um, ammo. So 36% ammo. It's, you know, it's representing that. So that all that um, uh, equipment that we got from the last battle is in um, the port. So it's going to be in the in the city that you fight in. And if we fought somewhere close to the city, it's going to put it um, in the closest city, I think it might put it in your inventory because we do have a supply with this this battalion. This is everything that's in the battalion. 
um, it might give it to them. You also have wounded. Uh, you do have the option to build. Oh my God. You do have the option to build med kits. I don't. I just don't see a need for them. Um, they do cost one cloth and one aluminum. So you do have the option to build that to fix your wounded soldiers. I just let them die. I mean, we got we got 2,500, almost 2,600 manpower. We don't. It's okay. I guess I'm going to talk about the campaign map and some of the strategies that I use when I'm using easy resource management options. And I said this earlier on in the video near the beginning that I use easy resource management in the options because I find using any of the, um, I just find it very tedious moving resources around to where I need them. Uh, my mentality is it's just more clicks. It doesn't change my strategy. It doesn't make the game harder. It just makes the game more tedious for me to have to go somewhere, find the resource, click it to where it needs to be, and um, wait for it to get there. When I have the resources here, and if I need them, I can just, I mean, the resources are here, just let the guys use the resources no matter where they are. Um, even with the easy resource management, I still need to move my weapons and manpower around. So, you know, I can't just build uh, battalions anywhere I want. Uh, but with the with the ammunition and building where I want to build, I'm just I'm going to explain why I use easy resource management and then the tactics I use with those settings, which I think work well. So again, the reason why I use the settings is because I find it tedious to move resources around when they're here. Just let them use them. Like I said, it doesn't. Even if I used um, the expert resource resource management settings it doesn't make my game harder it doesn't it wouldn't change my tactics on how i play the game all it would do would be to increase the amount of times i have to click the mouse that's it because that's the only thing it's going to change so instead of doing that instead of putting myself through that hell i'm just going to use easy 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 <laughs> i'm going to use easy resource management <laughs> to uh, just make the game easier. So when I do use those settings, what I tend to do is find one city that isn't a frontline city. So as you can see, our front line is pretty much here. Luongo, uh, Rasvet, Campelios, and Samelo. So these are our frontline cities. What I like to do is consolidate all of my resources, or at least, you know, 95% of them. Like I said before, I do have resources in other cities, uh, mainly just production cities where stuff's being built uh, with ammunition. Uh, we do have Bradley's being built in Verma. Uh, I don't know if I have any other vehicles being built right now. No, not at, not at this stage in the campaign. But anything that's just being built in the cities is there. I can still move it because sometimes it'll be on a frontline city or close. But what I'll do is I'll I'll consolidate all my resources into the main city so I know where they are and I'll move them up. Like I could technically move all these resources to Landena um, because it's it's just off the frontline city. And if we lost Compelios, it's far enough away that. Um, I could move it if necessary, because let's say we didn't notice an enemy out here or rebels spawned and we forgot about them or somebody uh, came into this port right away, uh, captured the port and we didn't have time to get a, um, a battalion to Verma to protect it. All I have to do is click on the city and so let's move it to Grova. Just click on there, um, find Grova click move all resources and it'll send them there and then this will just be an empty city so the enemy can capture this city and it's empty and all my supplies are now in Grova. So it's it. that's why I like to have all my resources in one area. And same with Campelios. We just captured the city in this um, campaign at this stage. So this is their capital city. Um, it has all of 
if not most of their resources. It's going to have all of their building resources, definitely. So what I'm going to do here in this scenario would be click on it, go to Verma. Verma there. I'm going to move all the supplies. And now they're all going to go to Verma. So now all of now we have we've consolidated the captured uh, resources. So let's say we had an army here. I mean, not that this would ever happen. Let's say we lost a battle with this army and they, or we saw like a huge army here and we retreated. Let's say they had a 30 stack of, you know, Duke Nukem's and, you know, we're like, there's no way we're going to win that. Um, we got to move out. They can take Campelios. Oh, there's still stuff here. It must've been from this army. So we can move it anyways. Um, so we moved everything out of Campelios. They're going to be taking over a dead city. There's nothing here. There's no production. Um, yes, there is. There's the military factories in Campelios. So if we come into cancel whatever that is, let's find Campelios. So it does have two military factories, but are we even using them? Well, not right now because we're not building anything. But like I said before, in the production queue, in the production. Um, side of this uh, tutorial, you're never going to use all of your production slots anyways, because chances are you don't have the resource income to support all that. Like, as you can see, even with me, I still have a ton of, like, all these empty squares are open slots for production. But the fact is, really, I don't need them, because I have mostly everything I need. And I won't have the resources up here, I won't have iron, aluminum, all the building blocks to build stuff in those queues to sustain all that production. So Campilios, we took the supplies out of it, but now if the enemy decides to take it back, big deal. We'll just, all we did was just lose a bit of ground. And I'll tell you one thing, they're probably not going to gain anything else. The only thing why I would really retreat is if we were low on ammunition or manpower. So all I would do was go to Verma, rearm them because the the ai doesn't really know how to blitzkrieg um they might capture salamo and then they're going to sit there for you know probably two to three weeks at least enough where i can get my army to that i have at least one person in the driver's seat and in the gunner seat and that's really all you need for your vehicles you infant support infantry is nice i mean it's great to have you know 10 infantry supporting this, well, technically eight infantry supporting this striker that I can unload because they're going to have RPGs. And, you know, obviously that's ideal, but all this unit really needs to be effective is one driver and one gunner. So you just need two people in there. So, you know, and that won't take a lot of time to uh, do to replenish. And then by the time I'm ready to go, I'll just come in here and destroy them and take the city back. And then so I've used all those resources I've stole to help me replenish my armies and then just, you know, keep repeating that process over and over. And, you know, before you know it, you're, you've won the game. So that's, that's kind of my strategy on how to play. Now there is Island nations. One thing I've, I haven't really talked about is navies. So what you do, um, it's hard to show you because I don't have a big Navy, but I do have three. It's, it's pretty much adds up to one Navy per one ship. Now the math might be a bit off on that. I don't know the exact measurements like hearts of iron three. Like you could see the weight that the unit that the landing craft could carry. And, um, you could see the weight of your unit. So you could kind of do the math and add that up. But here, here, there's really no um, indication on what stuff weighs. So it, it's almost a one-to-one. -one. So I could put three units on here. You just bring them to the port. Uh, make sure your, your navy is in the port. So you can see that icon. Oh, yeah, you can see that icon there, that little anchor. So now it's going to go inside the port. Okay, we're here. I can't put this army in here. It's way too heavy. But you would bring your navy or your infantry in here um once they're in here 
you'll get a little icon down under the forces tab, not the supply tab, but you'll get a little icon here that says load up the troops or something. I don't know what it is. I've only done it a few times. And then you can take your Navy to um, any island. I don't think I have any. Oh, we do. Oh, we have a Navy here. Okay. So you would take your Navy and my understanding is you can only do amphibious landings on a port. Now saying that I've had enemy infantry on my lands and maybe I missed them attacking the port, but then again, I, I had all my ports, but I have had infantry, um, island nations just to make sure because i know it was an island nation on my land over here on this campaign where i don't think they went into a port so maybe some of these beach areas i don't know exactly what constitutes you able to attack the only time i've ever had success is when i'm attacking a port so you would come through here i know there are ports up here somewhere is it right in here no okay so there are ports right here you would come over. It's not giving me the option to attack because I don't have any infantry attached to this one boat. But you would attack, um, do your battle, and if you won, you would capture the port. And then you could ferry in more troops as needed. So what I would do, I wouldn't... Well, it depends on the situation. I mean, you, you don't need a 10 stack to attack. But you kind it's kind of like you want to have more units than you need because you don't know what you're going to be facing up there. And it might take you a while to uh, replenish or um, get reinforcements up there quickly enough. Because, I mean, you'd have to, unless, you could kind of shorten your way by using this port up here to kind of short, short, uh, shorten the trip a little bit. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I, my, me personally, I would probably want to bring at least 10 to 20 troops up here of vehicles and stuff that I know where I'm going to you know, win the battles. Um, and how to equip them. I don't know if I went on, if I explained this before. I think I did. But when you build them, they'll show up in your supply and you need to create um, create naval units. So there'll be a button down here, create naval unit. They'll show up in your port. Once you build them, I mean, I don't know if I can, I, it says that I can delete them. So let's bring them into the port Let's delete them. Affirmative. Let's get rid of you. So they're back in the port now. So now, yeah, this create new naval battalion. You just click that as many times and it'll create your battalion. I don't think you can merge these. Roger. Yeah, you can't merge uh, naval battalions. You'd have to delete this. Go back in here. You probably want to delete all of them go back in it should be three yep there we go so the three are back in there that's the same with the air force uh once you once you build them you can delete them now you never used to be able to but uh they'll if when you build them they'll be in the air base that you build them in and uh you just you just create a new air force battalion you can only create one uh Air Force Battalion. So we're going to create our three helicopters here. But if I had jets in here, I wouldn't be able to build a jet battalion. I could only uh, build more helicopters. But you can move them. So I can take these helicopters and move them to any city that I want. But with but you're not going to be able to deploy them. Like I can move them to Verma, but I'm not going to be able to deploy them. I can redeploy them to Landina. And then, because it's an airfield, uh, and then deploy them there. But with your naval units, I'll delete them so they're in here. I click on them. I can only move them to other ports that are on the map. I can't move them to any other inland cities. You can also dump them as well. I don't know why you would want to do that. But uh, So that's how you kind of control your navy and air units. Um, air units don't do anything on the campaign map. They're only useful, as you saw, in battle. And I 
I'm assuming the more air units you have, the more airstrikes you have available. We had available three airstrikes and we also had three helicopters. So that might be how it worked. I haven't dabbled too deeply into the Air Force. One, because I really, I'm, I'm usually researching other things and I have gotten to B-2 bombers and they take so long to build. It was like over a year to build one bomber. So I did unlock them. I did put them on the queue, but then the game is over but by the time I even got to them. So I wasn't able to see what they do, which is unfortunate uh, because the helicopters, they kind of suck. But that's about it. Um, I think this tutorial is over. Finally, that was a long one. I knew it was going to be a lot of information, but uh, there's a lot to talk about with this game. And um, I hope the length of the video doesn't intimidate people. We're going we're to put timestamps on, so that will help. So I hope you guys enjoyed the tutorial. Like I said, if I forgot anything or I gave misinformation, let me know in the comments. If you guys want to check out any Total Conflict Resistance campaigns to kind of see... Um, my strategies and kind of what I'm talking about in practice. There's plenty of um, campaigns up on the channel, plus other series if you guys want to check those out. So if you guys enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will talk to everyone later. Have a good day. Bye for now.